welcome to a very special edition of today on this Wednesday morning. It's a day where we are getting set from a wedding, and yes, that is Buckingham Palace behind us, where about 25 minutes from now, Queen Elizabeth will come out to begin the royal procession towards Westminster Abbey, where the service will be held about one hour from now. The guests will start assembling there in, oh, about 10 minutes from now or so. First things first, let's talk about the weather. What do you let's think? Do I think that perhaps we should fix our attention on the blue sky and fluffy clouds over ahead so that we can remember how they were. We may not see much more of this sunshine. Exactly <laughs> the point. We should note that while it's expected to reach a high of somewhere about uh, 65, 68 degrees, they are saying it will get gray later in the day and we may even see some thunder showers. We've got an awful lot to show you and tell you about today. Our objective may well be, though, to not let any of it get in the way of what you really want to see in here. We've uh, brought along with us this morning a couple of royal wedding veterans who will be helping us out this morning. You may remember them from five years ago when they helped give our coverage of the wedding of Prince Charles and Lady Diana, a bit of a British accent. They are Robert Lacey, who has written extensively about the royal family, and Tina Brown, editor of Vanity Fair magazine, and also an expert on things royal. And good morning. Good morning. We haven't changed much in five years, but the wedding has changed a bit. This is a different proposition than the one we covered together five years ago, isn't it? Shall we count the ways? How is it different, Tina? I think it's quite a lot more relaxed than last year, last time, than five years ago. Uh, Prince Andrew and, uh, as he is now, the Duke and Duchess of York, they are, is not the heir to the throne. It's a much more festive, much more relaxed, slightly more knockabout, almost, if that's the right word, affair. People are taking it quite lightly, but with great joy. What about a bub? Well, yes, and of course, he was the younger child. He was born at a more carefree stage in the Queen's life. Uh, she had this family in two generations, first Charles and Anne, then the second two children, Andrew and Edward. And one of the remarkable things about London for the last few days has been the way the royal family have sort of turned it into a music hall, making practical jokes everywhere. Prince Edward turned up the other day uh, at the rehearsal with his arm in a sling, which caused great, great consternation. I'm struck as well with the fact that both of the, the bride and groom are 26. She, in fact, four months older at 26 than she is. But they come, they seem to, they strike me as an equal partnership, where Diana was 20 years old on her wedding day, and I think we've agreed that Prince Charles was, was 30. So it was, it was not the same kind of uh, team that we see today. And, and we have noted as uh, this week has progressed that this is not a national holiday, and yet we see a good number of people flanking, uh, flanking the, uh, the route today, the processional route. Yes, although first thing this morning I was here just after six and there were a lot of people just driving to work across here. The, the streets were still open and taxi. They didn't close away. them technically until 8.30 um, this morning, which was a couple of hours ago. Uh, Tina, you brought up uh, something our American viewers may not be aware of yet. The Duke of York is getting married today. <laughs> Indeed, yes. Uh, this morning at uh, 10 a.m. London time, the Queen announced that hitherto, hither hit the forward or whatever the word is. Uh, <laughs> Prince Andrew and Miss Sarah Ferguson will be known as the Duke and Duchess of York. It was a very brilliant move, really, of the Queen to do that on their wedding day because it stops or forestalls any possible killjoy standing up and saying he doesn't deserve that title or whatever. And it's a rather wonderful, joyous thing to find that they've got this new title, which is immensely grand, actually. The last uh, Duke of York later became George VI um, after the abdication. He was the younger brother, like Prince Andrew is, and he took over as king with well, the Queen well, Mother. Well, well, Americans think that uh, uh, they'd I'd rather be a prince, thank you very much, than a duke. Well, the Dukedom of York has this immensely grand ring. I mean, already one can see Sarah Ferguson turning into the Duchess of York. It's a rather sort of square jawed and implacable title. We're, and I think that Sarah is all destined for that. We're going to be getting to a lot of titles as this day progresses with Tina and Robert. But uh, let's meet some of our other people who are going to be helping us cover this over the next four and a half hours. We have our correspondents stationed all along the processional route and also in the hometown of the bride. Let's go there first and check in with our Stephen Fraser, who I will resist calling today our dumber correspondent. Stephen, is, is anyone left there in town? Yes, there are a few people here left, Bryant, and good morning. Uh, although many people have gone down to the route to see the procession, there are still some of the 300 residents of this small town here, and they're celebrating in a different way from those people who might be with you in London because this is, after all, a small village with a lot of history. It's 900 years old, and you'll see more traditional celebrations here. So this 100-year-old beer wagon here, uh, behind it, some Morris dancers, the people dancing those old fertility dances. This is the pub we're visiting here, the pub which is in the center of the village. And behind that, there's a pig roast and an ox roast. And you can just hear them starting up now with some singing, which doesn't sound like it's 900 years old, more uh, this kind of sound that Sarah might have grown up with here. 
the locals are completely overwhelmed by all of the media attention and the imported talent which is performing here, but they are responding with an awful lot of grace and good humor. And they've been partying all month, actually, Bryant, because this is the month celebrating their 900th anniversary. So we just want to let you know that as the day goes on, the party has already begun here, <laughs> and we'd like to check in with you later to let you know how it's going. All right, Stephen, thank you. We will certainly do that. Stephen Frazier's about 50 miles northwest of here. Oh, I guess about 550 yards behind me over there is our Henry Champ. He's over by, by, by Buckingham Palace, where he has been camped out with some of those who have been here for quite a while. Good morning, Henry. What are you finding over there? Brian, I'll tell you, it's very seldom you ever get in a crowd of this size where there's so much absolute enjoyment and just simple joy. People here have been lining up since 10.30 last night, sleeping over, just to get seats this close. The ones behind me, of course, would have been there for at least a day before. And amazingly, in this crowd, we have a good deal, a good number of Americans, people from Tennessee, from Ooh. Alabama, someone over there want, still believes, Brian, if you can believe, that the St. Louis Cardinals can, can get into the World <laughs> Series. <laughs> And an amazing number of British people. Every time, it, as, as you can see, there is also, every time any, if there's any kind of movement behind us, uh, a lot of appreciation and applause, uh, regardless of who goes by. What they're looking for is, of course, a glimpse of Fergie. That will be, for the majority of people here, the highlight of their day. And also a good deal of fascination among the part of uh, the women as to what the gown will look like. But, Brian, all I can say is that the people watching the program and yourself, if you were having as much fun as the group of people around me, it'll be a wonderful day. Okay, Henry, it promises to be that, and no, the Cardinals aren't going to make it this year, I don't think. When they do come out of Buckingham Palace, the Royal Procession will go around Victoria Memorial and then down through the mall here, underneath Admiralty Arch, and out through Trafalgar Square, which is where we find Willard Scott this morning. He has left his weather maps at home and uh, has joined them, as I can see. Good morning, Willard. Hey, good morning to you. How about I finally found one that fits? We're here. It's it just seems like a few years ago. Trafalgar Square, Lady Di, Prince Charles, Lord Nelson's got the best view of the entire parade. Looks right down Whitehall to the Abbey. And I'm here this morning with one of England's most photographed, if not the most photographed man in the entire Isle of Great Britain, Matt Belgrano. Good morning, Matt. Hello there, all right. I got to tell you, that is the most beautiful hair. And I, mine is a wig. Yeah, no, this yours is, is fake. a wig. Mine is real. Okay, that, prove mine's a wig. All right, go ahead. Oh, what a waste of time. You've got to have one like mine. You can't do that to me. All right, ready for it? No, you can't touch mine. I'm not going to pull real. yours off. This young man started this hairstyle. I, I assume that back in the truck we have some photographs. These photographs, these postcards, are the hottest selling items in the country right now. And I don't believe it. Thank you, Matt. That is beautiful. We're going to get Matt is an that agent. It? Uh, yeah, that's it. No, Matt. I want to take over. Okay, here. Matt. Right. Okay. I'm going to LA next week to do two weeks modeling. You've got to be there. You've got to get me lots and lots of work. Send me lots and lots of phone calls and get me lots and lots of work when I go. We'll get thank you. you. And we'll get you a haircut. All right. I don't believe it, Brian, but it looks cards. good. All right, Willard, thank you. It's a little dangerous down there. I would suspect it's a little safer down at the um, the destination of the Royal Processional Route. That's down at Westminster Abbey, which is where our Bob Jameson is this morning. And Bob, what are you uh, looking out at this morning? Have some guests already started to arrive? Good morning, Brian. Yes, some of the guests have already started to arrive, but the big crowd is about 10,000 people standing a dozen deep around the Abbey watching those arrivals. Some of those people have been there since Monday. We've had bells ringing here, and at precisely 10 o'clock this morning, several hundred of the guests, which I guess could be best described as friends of the royal family, friends of the couple, began filing in uh, some famous names from British film and television. The largest cheer was reserved for Pamela Stevenson, the television star here in Britain, and her friend, British comedian Billy Connolly. Dignitaries are at this moment expected to begin arriving, led, of course, by First Lady Nancy Reagan and then by some of the other royals from Europe, the Crown Prince of Monaco, the Princes of Sweden, but no heads of state because this is not a state occasion. All 1,800 seats in Westminster Abbey will be filled. Westminster Abbey is not the official name of this place. The official name is the Collegiate Church of St. Peter in Westminster, and it is much more than just a church. It is a place synonymous with Britain's history and tradition, and for a thousand years, a church has sat on this place near the Thames. It is the place where England crowns its kings and queens, the last the coronation of Andrew's mother 33 summers ago who, like those before her, received her crown before the high altar. And it has been the scene of other pageants of renewal for the British monarchy, royal weddings like this morning's. This was the marriage of Princess Anne to Captain Mark Phillips in 1973. Like today is not a state occasion, but what is considered here just a ceremony for family and friends. 
But the significance of Westminster Abbey has less to do with pomp and circumstance than it does with its role in the history of the English-speaking world. Edward the Confessor built the original abbey, and with its consecration in 1065, he joined church and state forever, and forever changed history. The next year, William the Conqueror was crowned here in the first of 37 coronations at Westminster. 200 years later, the original abbey was demolished and another built over its foundation. 300 years and a number of kings later, the church, except for its towers, was completed. Each succeeding king had a different idea of how the glory of God and man should be honored. As a result, the interior in places is a hodgepodge of styles and monuments. Some complain they have cluttered Westminster. Elizabeth I is buried here, so too is Mary, Queen of Scots, James I, and Charles II, in all 18 kings and 14 queens. In the 17th century, the great English poets joined the nobility. Together in Poets' Corner are the remains of Chaucer, Spencer, Dryden, Tennyson, but not Shakespeare. He is buried in Stratford, and not even an offer of money could persuade the people of his hometown to move Shakespeare to the Abbey. Eventually, others of distinction were granted the honor of the Abbey as their last resting place. Like Ben Johnson, Dr. Johnson was entombed standing upright. Westminster has also seen traditions begin that endure around the world today. It was here that people first stood during the Alleluia Chorus of Handel's Messiah, led by George III, the king, incidentally, who lost the American colonies. It was also in the Abbey in the 17th century that the Bible, used in a revised form by most of the non-Catholic English-speaking world today, was first put together. And it will play an important role this morning. Today's wedding vows will be taken from the 1662 Book of Common Prayer. And as written in that book, Sarah Ferguson will promise to love, honor, and obey her husband, resuming a tradition broken five years ago when Princess Diana vowed only to keep her husband. Incidentally, British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher and her husband Dennis arrived just a moment ago to a mixture, Jane and Bryant, of cheers and booze. Not surprisingly. Okay, Bob, thank you very much. We should also add that no heads of state were invited because uh, the, the prince is uh, fourth in line to the throne as opposed to what happened five years ago where Charles was direct. Yes, you were going to say? Well, I'm wondering, the, uh, queen, the uh, bride's escort should be arriving uh, shortly at Clarence House from whence she shall depart. And I'm wondering if they're going to put the windshield wipers on it. Oh, you the think glorious it's sunshine bad? we had is... is, is a little bit of a memory indeed, and it's starting to look a little leaden. Let me add one footnote, too, to what Bob just said, uh, that, that as the vows are taken, yes, she will say to obey. She said in, a, in an interview, which I know you're going to get to be part of in just a moment, that she feels very comfortable with, with leaving the decision to the man. And so, should it ever come to that, the obey would apply. She also said that, by the way, he's going to say worship. Yes, he'll do the worshiping. <laughs> it is now, uh, what, 45 minutes um, until the wedding at the Abbey. And how is that royal couple coming up? Well, let's take a, a look, if we can, at uh, some clips from that interview Bryant was referring to, an interview that was conducted by Sue Lawley of the BBC and Andrew Gardner of Thames Television, who asked them, well, how are you feeling? Great. Uh, reasonably exhausted, but uh, beginning to be on a real high. I think that, that uh, the last couple of weeks have been quite hard work, um, getting the final touches done. So you're looking forward, when you say you're on the high, you're looking forward to it? Yes, and the 24th. You've left the word obey in the, in the marriage vows. Why did you do that? Ah, interesting that is, question. That's a question that, that, that um, we've been discussing, and um, it was Sarah's choice. Um, and I think, really, that, that, that uh, Sarah is well, wanted, so wanted it in. And, well, since he's going to be worshipping, and I'm obeying, because he obviously he, uh, he doesn't say obey to, he worships, um, when it comes around to the same point of view. Um, I've, I chose to obey deliberately, because at one stage or another, if in a question of a dilemma or a situation, there will always be someone who has to make the final decision. Therefore, at one stage or another, you are going to, at some stage, going to obey your husband. But I think, let the man take the final decision. Therefore. Uh, so that is an, another example of, of obeying. So it's not just a, a, a spiritual or moral obey, it is a physical obey as well. It's very yeah. interesting, yes. It's, uh, I, I think it's more moral, it's than, more than, moral. than physical. I mean, uh, the, the straight obey as we see it today, I don't think, I, I personally haven't read it as me, the man, laying down the law. 
No, no, certainly no, not. That... Certainly not. I would, I would never lay the law down. No, Besides, but I'm just think... looking for a lead on some... When it, there really is a dilemma or really is a major decision, then I will say, yes, there is a phys physical obey. When it is normal, it will be a very much a moral obey in my mind. You seem to have had endless public occasions. I think the public, one way or another, has seen you practically every day. Has well, that been, Sarah, much more of a strain than you might have imagined? No, actually, it is, it is a, a lot of hard work, and I do get very tired. But um, I love every moment of it, and I find it very easy to do with him on my right. Yes, I don't think that, that uh, we've been seen every day. <coughs> we haven't Sometimes it's, there is, of course, a, a, a darker side to being in the limelight, and I think, in some ways, Sarah, you suffered from that because you were open to personal criticism, mm -hmm. and the press have talked about I don't know, what you wear or your, whether you're on a I diet, don't. your shape, <laughs> your weight. How much does that hurt? Hmm, very interesting. I, uh, to begin with, I sort of made that dreadful mistake of really taking in what they wrote and reading it. I now don't read it. There is no point in reading it. What's printed, you can't worry about because it's been print. But um, the message basically is you're just your own person. I and am you're We are our own persons, both well, of us. Yes. Um, and he's been tremendous help to me as well. I mean, he's certainly, you know, when I say, nah, whinging or something, he gets old, the old rod out and says, this is stupid, you're perfectly right as you are. <laughs> <Huh>? Never. <laughs> Again, that was part of an interview conducted by the BBC and ITV last night. Someone else who's been with us all this week for our coverage of the royal wedding has joined us this morning. He is Viscount Charles Althrop, who has his own perspective on royal weddings. After all, he has been through the one with his sister, Lady Diana, the Princess of Wales. Good morning. Good morning. Have Brian. you spoken with your sister this morning? Um, not this morning, no, but I spoke with her the other day. Huh? And uh, I think she's got quite a good outfit coming out. Turquoise. Now. Having been through all this, let's, let's take a look very briefly at yes. what's going on. And the Queen Mother is now heading into Buckingham Palace. She's already left the residence. Uh, shortly thereafter, she'll be leaving from Palace as part of the royal procession. Very popular figure. Yes? And she enters the palace as the, the Duchess of York. And later this morning, I guess it's my understanding, she will become the Dowager That's Duchess. right. And she'll be known as Elizabeth, Duchess of York. Or, of course, she'll be the Queen Mother to everyone else. Well, Jane asked that question a little bit earlier, and you might help straighten us out on that. I mean, doesn't it seem a bit of a, of a come down to go from a prince to a duke? Um, well, it's a different thing. You see, a royal duke is as good as a prince any day. And he will be still Prince Andrew, Duke of York. He'll just be known as the Duke of York. And it's a very great honor and uh, the Queen's personal gift to them on this day. Will she be known as... She will not be known as Princess Andrew. No. Which I think is wonderful. Yes. After Fergie, I hope she never sees that again. <laughs> but will she, in fact, not be a princess? Well, she will technically be a princess. She will. But she just will be known as the Duchess of York. The Queen Mom is as beloved as that applause Isn't that applies. the truth? Let's talk a little bit about Sarah Ferguson. I mean, having been through this with your sister, what might Sarah be going through this morning at this time? Well, I went to see my sister at precisely this time, the corresponding time, five years ago. And she was, uh, it's the first time I realized I had a beautiful sister, I think. <laughs> really? That's <laughs> a lovely looked, thing to she say. She looked really good. And the people had done a great job with the makeup. Not that that, that changed it totally. But um, she was very tired, but desperately excited. And uh, the Excuse real... me one second. There we see uh, Mrs. Nancy Reagan arriving at uh, oh, Westminster right. Abbey. Mrs. Reagan arrived here on uh, Monday and has been staying in London. And yes, she did go to a, a private party at, uh, held by the father of, of the bride, Major Ronald Ferguson. Now she's making her way into Westminster Abbey, being greeted there. This is a church one wants to get to on time. I'm told that there are already <laughs> 2,000 guests in place, even, right. even as we speak. Charles, um, speaking about, now it was lovely that it was the first time you'd seen your sister as beautiful as that. She was only 20. Now you are 22. Looking back, is it unimaginable that your sister took on what she did at such an early age? Yes, it's extraordinary. I mean, it makes you really proud when you realize what she took on then. And actually, all my sisters got married young, but of course, the responsibility which she took on, I mean, she, she can only have guessed at. And uh, the way she's come through, I mean, no one could have imagined that. What are you most anxious to see today? I mean, we see these millions who are lining the procession around, each for their own varied reasons. I mean, you obviously have a different perspective on all of this. What are you anxious to see? Well, I think it's always a great showcase for Britain, something like this, because the, the world does tune in to see what's happening. And everything down from the, um, the perfect drill of the soldiers and the, just the magnificence of the pomp, it, does, it gives England a tremendous buzz of excitement. And um, it shows the world what they can do, what we can do. I did, in fact, hear, hear um, 
one of your citizens this morning talking about what was special about it. And he said, I guess when you get right down to it, what makes it special is to watch all of this thing go off with precision before the eyes of the world, knowing that they know they can never hope to emulate it. <laughs> That's right. It's tradition coming to the forefront of modern day. This really is a different kind of affair than your sister face, though, isn't it? Well, it is, and it's very unlikely that Prince Andrew will become king. I mean, Dukes of York have become king. George V and George VI this century are both Dukes of York. But um, with two sons already for the Prince of Wales, it's just so unlikely. But he's a popular man, Prince Andrew, and Sarah Ferguson's taken the British imagination. Just as an asterisk uh, uh, to uh, bolster your credibility, as if you needed it, uh, Charles, uh, Charles read history at Oxford. <laughs> is anxiously awaiting the results of his exams, which yes. I take it you will know later this week, but never mind that. <laughs> right. We are looking on it at Clarence House where we can see some of the um, members of the, the bridal party uh, departing again. Prince William is in the first car, we are led to believe, and they are making their way towards, again, Buckingham Palace, where the, uh, the procession will be leaving from and then making its way onto Westminster Abbey. In case you're wondering about the drive time, it would wind up being somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 minutes. I shouldn't say somewhere in the neighborhood because they really do have this right, down the right. don't they? I think Prince William might be one person who's not too tired yet. There'll be plenty of energy in him. <laughs> Is this true that your sister has laid down a path of little candies <laughs> in order Smarty, to make sure? Though. Smarties is what Smart. they call them. That's right, what we might call like M&Ms. M&Ms. In order to make sure that he follows the correct path? I think that'd be the least thing she's done. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> sedated the Smarties. Now what happens if he decides to pick them up as he's going along? No, he'll be OK. Because I, my niece, as I, I mentioned yesterday, my niece, who's just come six. She said uh, last night on the telephone, she was taking this very seriously and she was going to keep an eye on him. Well, really? What, does, I, I, what do the, the pages don't wear little uniforms with swords? You were being facetious the That's other day. Right. When... Then, well, no, but when my uh, niece found out she was a bridesmaid, she was in a real sulk and everyone said, you know, don't be so spoiled. And the reason was she wanted to be a page boy with a sword. She's got this real tomboy thing. I hope they don't get a four-year-old boy a sword. <laughs> Let's take a quick moment and go back to Bob Jameson, who's down at uh, Westminster Abbey. Bob, what's going on in your beat? Well, Brian, you saw just a moment ago that First Lady Nancy Reagan arrived. Before she went into the church where you saw her, she stopped in her sea green dress and hat and turned and waved to the crowd and got quite a big cheer. Next on the agenda here is the arrival of part of Sarah Ferguson's family. Uh, her mother's husband, Hector Barantas, from Argentina, that was a touchy subject, wiped away when the queen invited him to the wedding, because of touchy because of the Falklands War and Sarah's grandmother, Lady Elmhurst, a 74-year-old widow. And we expect momentarily the arrival of the pages and the bridesmaids, including the son of Princess Anne, of course, uh, Prince William, the son of Charles and Diana, and, uh, of course, the half-sister of Sarah Ferguson, Alice, and her half-brother, Andrew. Bob, when Hector Barantes arrives there at Westminster Abbey, what, uh, along with his wife, Susan, who is Sarah's mother, what kind of a reception do you expect they will get from most of the people gathered there? Uh, it is expected that, uh, first of all, Hector Barantis will probably arrive on his own. Uh, it is expected that the mother of the bride and uh, her other daughter, Jane Macon from Australia, will arrive separately. Hector Barantis will go in the north transept door, which is not the front door of Westminster Abbey, so it's unlikely that a great deal of this crowd will see his arrival. Hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Bob. And again, we're looking at the, the scene at Westminster Abbey where um, wedding is, is, again, a little less than, than an hour away right now. Just how sensitive a subject is Hector's appearance at this wedding and his attendance at this wedding? I think um, he'll be welcomed. I, I mean, he's the bride's stepfather, and that's all that counts today. I mean, we are technically still at war with Argentina here. I, the, the, there's no peace signed. But um, people have basically forgotten the Falklands, except as a happy memory in that we beat them. I did note, however, that, uh, that Argentine television is not sending a crew to the wedding. Oh, really? Has booked no special airtime from the satellite for the coverage. That the only coverage they will get of the wedding is that which comes from the subscriber service Viz News, which is basically a couple a couple minutes, which they no doubt will carry if they. Find well, they the probably don't want the to news. see probably don't want to see parades of British soldiers. 
again. Mm -hmm. But, you know, from that file of how times change, it is interesting to know that at this wedding, there will be three members of Spanish royalty in attendance, whereas when your sister got married, they yes. were absent because of a conflict at the time over some land off of Gibraltar. And all yes. right, let's follow through with that. When the queen was married in 1953, she married uh, the uh, uh, Prince Philip, whose family was German, and his sisters, who were married Germans, were not invited to the wedding. Right. There's a wonderful tradition. <laughs> so you could actually get your history lesson from just looking at the guest list, That's right? right. Look at this. Yes. Now, what procession are we seeing here? These, are these the royal highnesses leaving for the abbey? That's right. Who are the royal highnesses, uh, Charles? Well, the ones who will probably be um, in those cars are people like Princess Alexandra, and I should think, in fact, some of the bride's family will be in there. I think in that second car, you've got the bride's mother. Um, but this is the sort of minor royalty, um, not the front, li front line. And they'll be in their open carriages and state carriages. I'm glad you were able to say that, because we, <laughs> we certainly would not have. You know, we are, all, we are all led to believe that royalty instinctively knows where to go on these things. Um, how much, like everybody else's wedding, are they led around and told, stand here, do this, then do that? Oh, they're, they're, they've got no choice. I mean, they have got a, to be... Uh, fitting in with a program and they've got no say in it at all. They're dragged out at these things and they go <laughs> home. <laughs> Did you look at it when you went through it as, as uh, a difficult experience or was it something that you just sat back and well, enjoyed? I was in something of a daze that day because uh, I had to light a bonfire. There's a chain of bonfires across England, if you remember, and I lit one in Northampton. I had to get back here and I couldn't find a taxi, so I didn't get to bed till about six in the morning. And I got up and uh, having had two hours sleep or something, staggered around. I mean, it's wonderful. It's all a bit of a blur, that's all. <laughs> that's kind of the way it is when you get married, I think. Yes. All right, and we are uh, presently awaiting the, the departure from Buckingham Palace of Her Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II. And she will uh, lead the royal procession around the Victoria Memorial and then up the mall, they will pass under Admiralty Arch through Trafalgar Square, make their way down Whitehall onto Westminster Abbey. She should be coming out any moment. I was waiting to see if that was a figure of a soldier on a horse. <laughs> well, I was too. Was it was interesting. He was, he was so, mo so motionless for a time that, that you were uh, they go a little bit reticent to do it. You see, they go around this courtyard and uh, this pick up the Queen and uh... we're gonna come back in just a moment and we will continue with the royal procession and get a glimpse of it right after these messages. Charles and Lady Diana, the Princess of Wales, part of the royal procession now making its way around Victoria Memorial to the cheers of the throne. And... The royal procession continuing around the Victoria Memorial now making its way up the mall to the applause of the throng, the Queen and the Queen Mother leading the procession. In the third carriage there we saw Princess Anne and her husband, Captain Mark Phillips. Looking at the Queen and the, uh, the Duke. Some of these people that you are hearing screaming have been uh, been out here, some of them close to 48 hours, to, uh, to get the views that they are enjoying right now. This is quite a big occasion for many of them. And that's the Princess Margaret seated next to the Queen Mother and Princess Margaret's children. Facing her on the other side. We have talked so much about what the bride will wear. Maybe we ought to take a moment to talk about what is proper attire for this wedding on this day. Tina? Well, the gentlemen have to wear a morning dress, top hat, full formal wear. Ladies, it's more fluid. They all have to wear hats. And most of them go for two-piece suits, silk dresses and jackets is the most sort of favorite outfit, usually in a, a pastel shade. Um, I see the Princess of Wales is in her wonderful polka dots, which she always chooses for this kind of affair. Wonderful polka dots. They are wonderful polka dots, yes. <laughs> 
gentlemen have been told they have to polish the insteps underneath their shoes so that uh, when they kneel down in the abbey, um, the underside of their shoes Thank looks... Thank you for explaining that. ...looks presentable. Is that really why that was done? I read that and I didn't understand no, it. That's why, because there'll be a lot of kneeling going on and you've got to look your best even on your knees. The royal women are very careful to... The royal women are very careful to make sure they're not in the same clashing colours or anything like that. And there's a lot of telephoning around about who's going to be wearing blue, who's going to be wearing yellow. They all do try and make a distinctive mark on these occasions. And one must also take care not to... Um, there's some of those, some of those wonderful polka dots you were talking about. The BBC cameraman will be wearing morning dress, too, in the Abbey. I'm surprised your NBC men aren't uh, dressed that accordingly. <laughs> well, they are underneath the raincoats. And it's not raining. It is not raining. We're raining. Would they put the tops up on the carriages? Is there such a, a, a There's a, a whole feature? set of carriages ready in case it rains, as the Irish state coach and various other closed-in carriages in case it rains. We are seeing some of the shots now from, from Westminster Abbey. That, that shot you had been looking at was looking, um, looking down the mall towards Buckingham Palace. That is the um, Duke of Kent there. The Kents have a very beautiful young daughter called Lady Helen Windsor, who's really a great beauty, and I think when she comes to get married probably in the next three or four years, that's going to be a big society wedding, because she is really probably the most beautiful uh, young woman in the royal family at the moment. The man with the glasses there is the Duke of Gloucester, who's another cousin of um, the Queen, and he works as an architect full-time. That's the controversial Princess Michael of Kent, um, who's... Uh, father was discovered recently to have had uh, links with the SS. Princess Michael has never somehow been able to live down her rather parvenu background and unlike Sarah Ferguson no one seems to be able to quite forgive Princess Michael for her checkered past. But she works at this. She is a very public figure isn't she? Princess, Princess Michael. Michael. She is indeed a very public figure and um, she was married before in fact to um, a banker. We, we are told right now that that is um, the bridegroom behind those doors, uh, getting set to depart from Buckingham Palace. Yes, Jane, that is a horse when he is going to move, <laughs> ultimately. <laughs> but uh, now the, uh, the Duke of York, yes. And here comes his carriage. Prince Edward, they, they technically don't call best man, they call him supporter, which I think is a lovely phrase. <laughs> the, the groom has already said, what are you in asking? What are you looking forward to? He said the 24th, which is tomorrow. Grooms the world over need some support on their wedding day. Funny how these things jump ahead as they do. Already I have heard a couple of people um, here, natives, I might add, um, speculating as to how big a deal it will be now when Prince Edward gets married, now that this one comes so closely on the heels of, of Prince Charles. I think it's always going to be a big deal because people do love this whole royal festival. Prince, I think a lot of it will depend on the character of the bride again. Prince Edward actually is the family intellectual. He, in fact, is the one who really does uh, seem to be quite an academic. And there we get our first glimpse of the, uh, of the bridegroom for the day. Riding Smiling. with his brother. With Edward beside him. Edward's going straight from university, intellectual though he is, into the Marines. Uh, really? Yes, I mean, it's a good safe, good safe berth for the royal family to do a few years in the services. Unlike his brothers, he does not fly. No, I don't think so. I think he's going to do all sorts of things like climbing cliffs and, and so on. Do you find that surprising, considering that he is such an intellectual? <laughs> no, I don't. Um, I, I mean, the services traditionally have... Um, no, no one in Britain can get offended if you go into the services. And uh, in almost anything else he does, um, he would be accused of capitalizing on his royal name. It's a good neutral kind of a role. He does not look nervous. I think he looks terrific. <laughs> He's a good-looking young man. He's matured enormously, too, in the last couple of years, Andrew, since the Falcons. I think Sarah's done a great deal, in a way, to help Really? Him. men on the coach will be a secret service men perhaps both of them will be and they're armed underneath that uh, ceremonial are my ears deceiving me or is he the crowd favorite on this day <laughs> the blue-eyed boy trying to stifle an urge to wave back. <laughs> 
You can see the Queen and Prince Philip now making their way. They should be uh, very close to arrival at Westminster Abbey right now, even as... Um, of course, on previous ceremonial occasions, it would have been uh, the bride's father, uh, Ronald Ferguson, who was riding there at the head of the, uh, at the, head of the troops. And there's a story of how, um, on one of these occasions, he was riding too close to the Queen, and she, uh, she turned to him and said, Ronnie, they've come to see me, not you. And uh, he then had to trot a little behind her. <laughs> We're going to come back in just a moment. We're going to get our first glimpse of the bride when, the, when we do. But first, we'll take a break here. This is a special edition of today on NBC. We're back now in London, continuing with a special edition of today and uh, awaiting the marriage vows of Prince Andrew and his bride, Sarah Ferguson. And again, we are joined up here by Viscount Charles Althrop, who is uh, the Princess of Wales' younger brother. This, um, this crowd, did the enthusiasm surprise you at all? Yes, I, I think it's incredible that they've turned out. I mean, it's not a public holiday, and uh, I think most people wanted it to be on a Saturday or something when they could all make it, but they've all they've camped out last night, just as they did five years ago. Well, there is 13% unemployment here, but I don't think all 13% <laughs> uh, accounts for all of them. Did, did some people just, just play right. hooky, it seems? I think so. I think a lot of bosses have been sympathetic, <laughs> too. We will be seeing the bride in about five minutes, which is something I think everybody looks forward to above all this morning. She'll be inside that glass coach, however, and my recollection of, of, of your sister at first glimpse like this was that it was all just billowing white with a very familiar face, but you don't really see what yes. you want to see, that dramatic exit from the carriage until the bride actually arrives at, at the Abbey. As we just saw, the, um, the Queen and, and Prince Philip are, are arriving at the Abbey uh, right now, even as the the bridegroom continues to make his way down the mall. He's trailing by, oh, I guess about what, seven or eight minutes in the procession. Uh, the bride will be the last to arrive. And once she arrives, uh, the wedding will get underway. And it's scheduled now for, what, about 30 minutes from now, 35 minutes from now. She'll be met by um, Major Ronald Ferguson, who in fact proposed to my mother uh, 35 years ago. Pardon? Major Ronald <laughs> proposed to my mother. Really? What yes. kind of proposal was this? Well, he was going off in the army on um, active service in Germany. Uh, this is in 53, coronation year. And he asked my mother if when he came back in two months' time she'd marry him. And she said no. <laughs> what a bottom line to a story that is. Well, and, uh, but it has a happy ending. <laughs> Here we do see uh, Her Royal Highness Queen Elizabeth II <laughs> arriving at Westminster Abbey with Prince Philip. <laughs> That's a classic story. <laughs> Were my ears deceiving me earlier, or does the crowd tend to play favorites as the royal family goes by and the applause is louder for yeah. one than another? But people seem to think they know the uh, characters of the royal family from the popular press, and uh, they're a definite favorites, and the Queen Mother couldn't be more popular. The popular press, is that what you're calling them for, for um, the benefit of our audience on this day and being diplomatic? Well, popular as in for the people, rather than popular as in <laughs> popular likes. Popular as in as far as you're concerned. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Do you think you know Andrew quite well? No. I've met him, but I, I don't know him well. Direct impressions? Certainly uh, interesting, uh, sort of outrageous, and great fun. I think for somebody to live uh, in a goldfish bowl like he has done, to have that much character, is a, it's, it's a great thing. Even as we, um, we see the Queen, arriving there at Westminster Abbey. I've got to ask you, has, has your sister, to a certain extent, been surprised at how much attention? I mean, I know she expected a great deal of it, but is she apprised the extent of it? Yes, I think so. I, m I remember going to see her a few times after, in the months after she was married, and she kept sort of saying that she couldn't believe it. But does she have to be a little careful? Has she been this summer? There's the Queen Not Mother. Not stage, Sarah. Which is, she doesn't want to do that. Of course she wouldn't want um, to, but, but how could she help it? She's probably the most famous woman in the world today. Well, yes, but there's not a lot she can do about that, really. Of course not. So I think she's, she's never tried to upset you, and that's the important thing, and, and Sarah understands, I'm mm -hmm. sure. And there's your sister. Yes, I told you it would be a nice dress. <laughs> what can you tell me about the polka dots? The, the, this has definitely been her season of polka dots, everything. Yes, yes, I think she's uh, cornered a market here. <laughs> I don't know who makes them, but they're doing very well. 
There they are, all ready to be put in their pews. We can start uh, uh, telling you a little, the little that we know about the bride's wedding gown in about two minutes. What I know is embargoed for That's that right. long. That's right. We'll see You notice my eyebrows went up the minute you even brought it up, <laughs> yes, because while we, while we do have some information about it, we are we not allowed tell to uh, tell you a thing about it until you get your first glimpse, and that is coming up now in... in Oh, I guess about 45 seconds. I, I was going to say know, somewhat less than a minute. I even know where these zippers were manufactured here in London. Is that right? I do. But I can't tell you. Of such <laughs> secrets are great fortunes born. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the bride is at, is at Clarence House, and, uh, and she will be making her appearance shortly, oh, I guess somewhere in the neighborhood of now 30 seconds. And again, she will then make her way on to Westminster Abbey by a different route than the rest of the royal procession. And um, when she arrives, the wedding will be getting underway. Again, Prince Andrew and his supporter, as Jane told us a little bit earlier, Prince Edward, we are looking now at Clarence House. And we are looking for the bride. <laughs> Is it my imagination, or have I seen more redheads on the street these days um, with this going on? Yes, I think a lot of Hannah bottles have been sold. Here she comes. <laughs> Here she comes. Look carefully. Our first glimpse of the dress. Jane was right, you can't tell much from that. Oh, but it still makes the heart go. <laughs> yes. Do you love her. Now, we do, um, although we are embargoed a little bit from telling you much about it, uh, these are the tape sketches of the dress that she is wearing today. And contrary to all that we had heard about it being wild and outlandish, it looks very traditional, doesn't it? And it is not peach colored with red accents. Um, it features a lot of detail work that uh, the designer uh, is, is known for. But look at the sleeve here. There you can see the, 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 the silk of the sleeve. I don't know how to speak in fashion terms, and I don't think most of our viewers understand it either. But it looks to me to be a good deal more understated than, uh, than Lady Diana's dress was five, five years ago. The train, for instance, is merely 17 and a half feet long. <laughs> <laughs> and and oh, the uh, Princess of Wales was? Yards and yards and yards and yards. There's that wonderful picture of the, her train going from the bottom of the steps at St. Paul's to the top, and there were scores of steps. Well. There's a better, there's, oh, look, she's. In about 12 minutes, she's going to be arriving at Westminster Abbey, and we will get a full view of the dress, and we'll be getting to that when we come back. But first, from London, we'll take time for these messages. We are back in London, where we are joined once again at home base by author Robert Lacey and editor of Vanity Fair, Tina Brown. And yes, we are looking at Westminster Abbey, where the bridegroom and his brother have made their arrival. at an indoor shot, but I'm going to make an outdoor observation. The bride leaves Clarence House and the sun comes out. It's a wonderful area. <laughs> of course, you'd say the same if it, if it rained. In, in Britain, it's all right to be rained on if you're a bride, because most brides probably are. That's why it's so unusual when the sun comes out. It has to be a good area. There's the bridal procession right now, making its way down the mall. And in the, 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 I don't know, is that the front seat of the carriage, the, car the, the seat facing the bride and her father? Well, you was that 17 and a half foot train? I, did you see the white billows <laughs> <laughs> nestled in the I was going to ask, you know, I didn't want to seem dumb on that, but how does one get a 17 and a half foot train in I don't know. What few people realize is how incredibly hot it is inside that glass coach. Really? Yes. The Princess of Wales nearly melted away. It was so hot. And uh, apparently another five minutes and she would have fainted into the arms Why? of the Why? This group. is a very cool day. It's a cool day. There's right no air conditioning in it. Hot. Oh. It, was, it was very hot. And they don't put the windows down. <laughs> There's no air conditioning and all that satin and tulle makes for a very hot journey. In case we had not noted it uh, a couple of times earlier today, or in fact earlier in the week, what you are seeing here is a wedding between two enormously popular individuals among the people here. But also a very ordinary wedding in some ways. I was hearing the other night that Sarah was telling a couple of her friends she got them good seats in the Abbey. I mean, they've been very much involved in all, all the details of it. 
Sarah has been to the church and personally picked out all the flowers and where each flower is going to be. She's really masterminded every single detail that we're going to see today. As they make their way through Trafalgar Square, we, uh, we add that uh, she, in fact, we are told, kicked off her shoes at the rehearsal and started playing out a little ditty on the organ. Right in the Abbey? That's true. That's a, what, three and a half minute a stroll up that blue carpet with a couple of thousand guests watching and well it is oh, supposed to be it is supposed to be me. four but someone who walked it the other day during rehearsal said they walked as slow as they could and couldn't get it past two and a half i think they are on the slow side because if you have a 17 and a half foot train you can't really take any risk <laughs> there's the queen with her new reading glasses <laughs> why do you say new reading glasses <laughs> well she's her eyes her eyesight is getting worse and um the, 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 there's quite, a, quite an industry in imitating the Queen's glasses in Britain these days as she changes them. I think the day she gets bifocal contact lenses, you'll know the monarchy has really leapt on another decade. I'm told that the people, the guests inside the, uh, the abbey itself, probably won't see very much. No, but there are I... monitors, though, inside for them to look at. <laughs> really? Yes. For the first time. <laughs> The majority of the they... guests are Sarah's friends, actually. The, uh, in fact, the Spencer family have not been invited at all. It was, the, there's, it was such a close-packed uh, church that uh, Sarah really has held the day. Obviously, her priorities. Well, that's our good fortune, because uh, Viscount Ulfer, uh, Diana's brother, is, could be with us instead of in yes. church. And her old boyfriends are there, which um, is, uh, you know, the, men, the couple of men that she's lived with, she's invited. And uh, Prince Andrew's got his old girlfriend, uh, Sandy Jones, from Canada. Do you not think well. that unusual? No, I don't. Um, I mean, I think it's a mark of, I was going to say, it's a mark of the informality of this couple. Then, of course, Prince Charles had his old girlfriends at the, at the wedding as well. But they were probably old friends of the family with profound royal connections. Not everyone. Uh, well, Susan I mean, was the old, was Yes, Susan, I was going to say, it was the old coup Stark in Prince Charles' past that nobody writes about much. Coup Stark is conspicuous by her absence, and uh, I think it's rather shame, really, that she she's didn't get an invitation. now, too. She's got her own priorities also. Major Ronald Ferguson is making his arrival, as is his daughter. And they will um, meet at the entrance there to Westminster Abbey, and once they arrive, we'll be set for the ceremony. Now, he's a military man. I'm told a very, very proper military man. Yes, he's known as the Galloping Major. I mean, he's enormously um, serious and sort of traditional man, and this is really his finest hour. He's always been rather on the fringe of royal circles, and now he's right there in the middle, and he's absolutely over the moon. He's been talking a bit about his anxiety about blubbing, because apparently he blubbed at his other daughter's wedding. Blubbing? Blubbing, blubbing that means welling over tears or welling or up, up, yes, or? which is not, of course, a very manly thing to, to do, not for a He feels for particularly major. emotional about his daughters because he's the mother, uh, Mrs. Barante, has absconded and left him really to bring them up, and I think he feels that they had a raw deal and a tough time, and... Uh, I brought him closer. So he's problem. a sympathetic he figure. He's a sympathetic figure because he was dumped, really, with the children and uh, handled it, really, with rather a lot of aplomb and, and obviously made a success of it because the two girls adore him. I might also add that Sarah adores her, her stepmother, Indeed. who she fondly calls, what, the wicked stepmother, right? <laughs> well, I think the old galloping major must have something because both his wives have been exceptionally good-looking. Um, the present wife is very, very pretty, and the one who absconded was absolute beauty. She's a sort of Ralph Lauren woman with long, willowy hair and marvellous sort of You can see him right in there making final adjustments. Indeed. This must be a thrilling time for them. He doesn't strike me as a man one would call daddy. What does a proper Br British girl tend to call her father? Well, no, I'm sure Sarah, I know Sarah calls him daddy. Really? Yes, definitely. Or dad occasionally. But as Tina says, they, they have been very close indeed. There's some debate as to which of the two daughters he's, he's fonder of. He's not dreadfully fond of his Australian son-in-law. He was rather disappointed with that marriage. The other daughter married a, a young farmer who came over. And um, from what one knows, Ronnie wasn't too pleased farmer. about that. In the American sense, farmer? Or is he a, a grand landowner? No, I don't think he is a grand landowner. No, he's not. No, he's got, a, he's, he's got rather an undistinguished ranch down in Australia. And he cracked some rather blue jokes at um, the party the other night, which didn't go to home very well either. Any we can repeat here? Afraid not, I okay, wonder about thank them. You. <laughs> you already screened them, right? In many ways, one feels that sister was responding to the mothers leaving the home. She sort of, as soon as her mother left, almost immediately, she rushed off to Australia and eloped at a very young age. At 18. This, at 18. And I think probably she wouldn't have done that if her mother had been around. It was almost that like she was emulating her mother. 
They're right in the middle of the picture is the Queen Mother, the, I mean, the best loved royal of all. There was a mildly scandalous book written about her this year, and uh, it was remarkable the way bookshops refused to stock it. I mean, and um, um, Penelope Mortimer, the once very respected author, got almost unanimously bad reviews. Just because she's a British institution, you don't take on the Queen Mother. Maybe it would be inappropriate for you to, to share with us some of these scandalous items, but perhaps later in the day. No, simply that she drank a little and she didn't like the Duchess of Windsor, fairly well-known stuff. And right now, the bride and her father, Major Otto Ferguson, making their uh, final approach to Westminster Abbey. Well, you can hear the crowd. to get married and I was so struck with how convincing she was. I don't think she's nervous. I think she's just anxious to marry the man she loves. I believe these I believe these kids. Well I do <laughs> think you. I do think that, that we all do have something in common uh, with this occasion. I mean in your own wedding day if you recall, by the time the event finally came you just wanted to get it done with. Just get it over with <laughs> and be over and done. And Sarah is a very much more self-possessed young woman anyway than the Princess of Wales was. I mean this is a woman of nearly 20 who's lived a life already and she's not perhaps as daunted and terrified as, as Lady Diana Spencer as she then was. And about this obey business, the Prince said last, last night in the interview, he, had, he did not read this as a, a matter of, quote, laying down the law. He seemed so anxious to underplay the obey. It struck me as a, a modern, uh, a very modern prince, uh, uh, stressing at every turn, equality, partnership. So, uh, I felt that, that Sarah, in a way, was rather anxious to, to stress the fact that she would, in fact, bow to him. Old-fashioned, old yes. Fashion. She emphasized her old-fashioned strength. Very much so. The English upper-class girls have not actually discovered women's lib. I mean, it's really passed them by completely, in a way. But see, I disagree. I think she has discovered it. Oh, but she was, was going to pay that to was cute. downplay <laughs> it. That was oh. cute. And I, and I wish I could identify. I do believe that was Prince William who just laid a little kiss on... Yes, the, the little well, um, the little page boys, two are dressed as midshipmen. I, is that term clear to you? Yes. And then two, including Prince William, in sailor suits. And that's uh, Linda Chirac, is that? Uh, Chirac. Yes. She is the designer like the Emanuels five years ago, is left with the details of making sure it lies just perfectly. This is the unveiling of the dress that everyone is waiting for. And this is the historical photograph moment. This is... I think the first feeling is one of great relief because there were all kinds of dreadful rumors that the dress was going to be peach and scarlet and short. But who really believed this? <laughs> well, it was very good fun. It's a good decoy. But she's gone for a very traditional dress, which I'm pleased about, because I don't think something very... Uh, adventurous would have been right. The veil and uh, the, the headpiece is, is somewhat more more than I than I had expected. Yes. She's got such wonderful hair. I think she's made that the focus of her. I don't know if you can hear it or not, but the people down there are yelling, Sarah, Sarah. She doesn't seem very royal, but... Well, she walks in, Miss <laughs> It Ferguson, is nonetheless you know, warm. And she walks out today, the Duchess of York. Amazing transformation. 17 and a half feet. A much more manageable length than the Princess of Wales 30 foot, which she struggled with so charmingly in the wind, as people might remember, when she came out of the church, and Prince Charles stopped and helped her unfold it. She says... She does look, she looks happy. And yes, she looks thin. Now, now, now. Yes, she looks wonderful, actually. I mean, she does look... There's the bow. Terrific. That as the, the ubiquitous bow uh, at the, at the begin, top of the train, which is not technical fashion jargon, but a very large bow that one would expect. She's very well known for her bows. And she's not one for looking down at her toes, which is what the Princess of Wales was always doing. The dress is made in a rich ivory silk duchess satin. And probably the most distinctive thing about it is not the shape, really, or the cut, but the fact that the bodice is embroidered. Uh, with her own coat of arms, which has thistles and bees in it, which is a wonderfully unusual touch. Are we on schedule or what? Yes, very much so. <laughs> oh, to the second. Right on the button. <laughs> yes, it's extraordinary, the timing for something like this. It's all three minutes past and 28 minutes to, and it's always kept to, to the very second. Of course, 
we have a lot of practice at it and, and, and all the, the coachmen and the troops as well. They've, they've done this many times before. One of the prettiest aspects, actually, of Sarah's appearance today are things that viewers won't be able to see, which is her shoes. These are little satin pumps made from the same material as the dress and embroidered uh, like the dress in uh, bugle beads and diamonds, uh, in thistles and, and ribbons. All these thistles and ribbons are actually a throwback to a more traditional sort of royal wedding dress when the Queen got married. Keep your eye as well after we have gobbled up uh, the image of the bride on the little people, the attendants. The oldest is eight, the youngest is Prince William, who is four. And they could be a little story in their own right. <laughs> well, I think it's the first today? time Prince William has been to church. He talks so much and he's frankly so badly behaved <laughs> that he doesn't usually go to church. I think they're all rather worried about what he's going to do. As the fanfare is sounded and we listen to the Imperial March, we might add that that is being beamed in uh, back here across the street from Buckingham Palace over a public address system. So these people who have stood waiting, some of them all night, are not left out at this point. As you see the bridegroom taking up his position, let us tell you that when we cut back to um, the Major and the Bride, the first little boy behind the Major will be Prince William of Wales. He's looking down. I wonder if he's looking for the Spartans. <laughs> The suit that her father is wearing is the very same suit in which he got married. Um, he said it was a bit green at the edges, but um, Sarah He was able said to get into it, though. He was able I'm to impressed. Yes, he had the waistcoat let out a little bit, uh, but the frock coat is, is, is the very same one he wore on his own wedding day. Because I don't know about you, Robert, but <laughs> mine would never fur. <laughs> Sarah's dress is a much more traditional choice than the Princess of Wales. The designer who did it um, has done a lot of her friends. She's not a, a particularly famous designer, but she is a sort of in designer. There is Prince William on the lower right of your screen. And yes, he is looking down. I wonder if the... <laughs> Isn't that his little cousin? The little girl is, is Sarah Phillips. That's He's right. dragging Princess her Anne's along. Daughter. I think she's she wants to go in a more ceremonial, <laughs> majestic pace. And he looks like he wants to get there. It's hard for the little people. It's hard for the big ones. You can imagine what it is for the little ones. It's more a tradition here in America. Of, of course, the bride's attendants would, would tend to be her her sisters, her, her dear best friends. But but that's I'm told at least in this century not much the tradition here in Britain. They do. Also, I think she probably felt that to have the Princess of Wales, perhaps, as a bridesmaid, <laughs> would be rather being upstaged. <laughs> I would think so. <laughs> it really is her day, isn't it? Do you remember uh, five years ago when, when Lady Diana fluffed her intended's name during the vows? Indeed, Yesterday, Sarah said she has a system for remembering. That's right. Andrew Ace. <laughs> Andrew slash Albert Christian Edwards, so that she's sure not to, to forget it. That's lovely. Andrew was thoroughly beaming as he got his first shot of her, of her all the time. Um, he very touchingly said he hadn't seen it or glimpsed it or had any notion of it, and I believe him. He's a very traditional young man, and I think he loved the fact that he was going to get his first glimpse on the arm. Harry, look at that look. <laughs> Enjoying this, aren't you, Mr. Well, you know, I, you know what I was struck by as I was looking at that? By the very lovely thing that Viscount um, Althrop said earlier when he first greeted his sister on the wedding day, how he hadn't realized she was so beautiful until then. Yes. That was a very lovely thing to say, and I get the feeling very much that the prince is feeling bad. That's her train with the A embroidered in the middle of it. She can't use that for anybody else's wedding now. <laughs> <laughs> what a terrible joke. Somebody just said, I guess that's the A train. Uh, no. <laughs> you have to repeat it. 
very much that's a personal matter of exchanging vows and I think that was a touching thing. We should get to see their faces too as they exchange their vows and unless the uh, right, Reverend Lancy moves six inches one way or another and interferes with the, uh, the, the camera that is in charge of taking but that's a new development because Charles and Diana chose not to be able to see their face at that very intimate and personal moment. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here in the sight of God and in the face of this congregation to join together this man and this woman in holy matrimony, which is an honorable estate 
instituted of God himself, signifying unto us the mystical union that is betwixt Christ and his church, which holy estate Christ adorned and beautified with his presence and first miracle that he wrought in Cana of Galilee and is commended in Holy Writ to be honorable among all men and therefore is not by any to be enterprised nor taken in hand unadvisedly, lightly, or wantonly, but reverently, discreetly, soberly, and in the fear of God, duly considering the causes for which matrimony was ordained. First, it was ordained for the increase of mankind according to the will of God, and that children might be brought up in the fear and nurture of the Lord and to the praise of his holy name. Secondly, it was ordained in order that the natural instincts and affections implanted by God should be hallowed and directed aright, that those who are called of God to this holy estate should continue therein in pureness of living. Thirdly, it was ordained for the mutual society, help, and comfort that the one ought to have of the other, both in prosperity and adversity. Into which holy estate these two persons present come now to be joined. Therefore, if any man can show any just cause why they may not lawfully be joined together, let him now speak, or else hereafter, forever hold his peace. I require and charge you both. As you the Reverend Main now steps back, and his place is taken by the Archbishop of Canterbury. That's the Most Reverend Right Honorable Robert Runcie. That if either of you know any impediment, why ye may not be lawfully joined together in matrimony, ye do now confess it. For be ye well assured that so many as are coupled together otherwise than God's word doth allow, are not joined together by God, neither is their matrimony lawful. Andrew, Albert, Christian, Edward, wilt thou have this woman to thy wedded wife to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? Wilt thou love her, comfort her, honor and keep her in sickness and in health, and forsaking all other, keep thee only unto her so long as ye both shall live? I will. Sarah Margaret, wilt thou have this man to thy wedded husband to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? <clears throat> Wilt thou obey him and serve him, love, honor, and keep him in sickness and in health, and forsaking all other, keep thee only unto him, so long as ye both shall live? I will. Who giveth this woman to be married to this man? Andrew Albert Christian Edward. I, Andrew Albert Christian Edward. Take thee, Sarah Margaret. Take thee, Sarah Margaret. To my wedded wife. To my wedded wife. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health to love and to cherish to love and to cherish till death us do part till death us do part according to god's holy ordinance according to god's holy ordinance and thereto i plight thee my troth and thereto i plight thee my troth
I, Sarah Margaret. I, Sarah Margaret. Take thee, Andrew Albert Christian Edward. Take thee, Andrew Albert Christian, Christian Edward. To my wedded husband. To my wedded husband. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love, cherish, and to obey. To love, cherish, and to obey. Till death us do part. Till death us do part. According to God's holy ordinance. According to God's holy ordinance. And thereto I give thee my troth. And thereto I give thee my troth. In thy name, O Lord, we hallow and dedicate this ring, that by thy blessing, he who gives it and she who wears it, keeping true faith the one to the other, may abide together in thy peace, continue together in thy favor, live together in thy love, and finally dwell together in thine eternal kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. With this ring, with this ring, I thee wed, I thee wed, with my body, with my body, I thee worship, I thee worship. And with all my worldly goods, and with all my worldly goods, I thee endow, I thee endow, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Let us pray, O eternal God, creator and preserver of all mankind, giver of all spiritual grace, the author of everlasting life. Send thy blessing upon these thy servants, this man and this woman, whom we bless in thy name. But living faithfully together, they may surely perform and keep the vow and covenant betwixt them made, whereof this ring given and received is a token and pledge, and may ever remain in perfect love and peace together, and live according to thy laws, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Those whom God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. For as much as Andrew Albert Christian Edward and Sarah Margaret have consented together in holy wedlock and have witnessed the same before God and this company and thereto have given and pledged their troth either to other and have declared the same by giving and receiving of a ring and by joining of hands, I pronounce that they be man and wife together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, bless, preserve, and keep you. The Lord mercifully, with his favor, look upon you and so fill you with all spiritual benediction and grace that ye may so live together in this life that in the world to come ye may have life everlasting. Amen. Amen.
Prince Charles has now made his way to the lectern. He will do the reading of the service. <clears throat> the lesson is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 3, beginning at the 14th verse. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Here endeth the lesson. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, which art in heaven, 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 hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, come. thy will be done. In the earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. O Lord, save thy servant and thy handmaid. Who will they trust in thee? O Lord, send them help from thy holy place. And be unto them a tower of strength from the base of their enemy. O Lord, hear our prayer. And let our cry come unto thee.
Almighty God, giver of life and love, bless Andrew and Sarah, whom thou hast now joined in Christian marriage. Grant them wisdom and devotion in their life together, that each may be to the other a strength in need, a comfort in sorrow, and a companion in joy. So unite their wills in thy will, and their spirits in thy spirit, that they may live and grow together in love and peace all the days of their life, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who has given marriage to be a source of blessing to mankind, we thank thee for the joys of family life. May we know thy presence and peace in our homes. Fill them with thy love and use them for thy glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. O merciful Lord and Heavenly Father, by whose gracious gift mankind is increased, we beseech thee, assist with thy blessing these two persons, that they may both be fruitful in procreation of children and also live together so long in godly love and honesty, that they may see their children Christianly and virtuously brought up to thy praise and honor, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. O Lord God, when thou givest to thy servants to endeavor any great matter, grant us also to know that it is not the beginning but the continuing of the same until it be truly finished, which yieldeth the true glory. Through him who for the finishing of thy work laid down his life, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies and giver of all grace, we ask thy blessing on the members of the royal family as they fulfill their service among us, that both by their word and example, our nation and commonwealth may be strengthened in love of righteousness and freedom and preserved in unity and peace, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, pour upon you the riches of his grace, sanctify and bless you, that ye may please him both in body and soul, and live together in holy love unto your life's end. Amen.
here, we're looking at, um, at Prince William, who Viscount uh, Althrop has told us, yes, he is a, a little bit restless, but one day will be head of the uh, Church of England. God, the Holy Trinity, make you strong in faith and love, defend you on every side, and guide you in truth and peace.
and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be among you and remain with you always. now be um, leaving off to a side chapel there to sign the, uh, the register. They'll be back in, what, about 10 minutes in between. We will be hearing a, uh, a couple of sopranos, one British, one American, uh, doing a couple, a couple of works inside. And we are uh, continued to be joined here at our home base by author Robert Lacey and Tina Brown, the editor of, um, of Vanity Fair. Maybe, Robert, a, a quick explanation is in order because our viewers saw an awful lot of clerics taking part in the ceremony and being heard from. Why? Well, because that was a Church of England service, and although um, uh, the Queen is head of the church, uh, there are a lot of other churches that people in Britain belong to. There was a blessing from the Church of Scotland, and also from Cardinal Basil Hume, who's head of the Catholic Church here as well. Was that unprecedented, or was that precedent? No, I think uh, this started with the wedding of Prince Charles, because Prince Charles is actually quite a close personal friend of Cardinal Hume. It was controversial, though, to, to, to some members of the... Well, it's interesting. I mean, it's like all things. Five years ago, it was controversial. Now, everybody takes it for granted. Our first soprano is um, British. She is Felicity Lott.
Felicita Lott has completed um, her Mozart anthem, and now another will be sung by Arlene Angers, an American soprano. Just noting here that um, her selection, Bob Andrew and Sarah Ferguson, to even take part, raised some eyebrows here, in part because she's American, and in part she, frankly, is not terribly well known. Last year they had uh, Kiri Tikanawa at uh, Prince Charles's wedding. I think she was Charles's personal friend as well as his personal choice. Well, she was also a New Zealander, which meant she represented the <laughs> Somebody help me. What are they doing back in that confessor's chapel? Well, they're all, one of the reasons it takes so long, apart from getting the train through the door, um, is that uh, they've all got to sign it, all, all the members of the royal family, and I think they sign it twice. Um, so there's about 18 or 25 or so signatures to go on the sheet of paper twice. And she will sign Sarah, Duchess of York? I think she will now, yes. I am told it takes both signatures for it to be legal, yes. It was funny, after all that talk about Ace and remembering it, <laughs> She stumbled just a little bit. Well, she didn't forget anything. She just doubled up a little on this well, that's all right. third name. That you can get away with. As soon as uh, Miss... As soon as Miss Auger has, has completed her Mozart anthem, then uh, the... I started to say bride and bridegroom. But Prince Andrew and the Princess Andrew will be um, coming me, out of the Duke confession. of York and That's the true. Duchess. That's of true. York. Will be come, but she is still the Princess Andrew. No, she's not the Princess Andrew. Yes, she can be called the Princess yes. Andrew, but um, I think it's a mark of her personality that um, she'll be known. I think she'll just be known as Fergie. I'm not sure. <laughs> I heard a, 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 a spokesman from Debrett say that she would not be the Princess Andrew. Really? Well, I mean, technically, I mean, I think she's got a choice. Just like technically, Lady Di could still be called the Princess Charles, um, but she's known as the Princess of I Wales. I suspect once she has taken that vow, she is forevermore the Princess Andrew. But we'll find out. We'll ask uh, Viscount Althorpe. I mean, bit later I mean the point being out. that you can only be called Princess Anne if you're born a princess. If you become a princess, writing correct with Princess of Wales as Princess Diana, as people do. Princess Anne can be correctly referred to, though, as Mrs. Phillips. She also can, <laughs> yes. I think she'll be known as Princess Sarah, in a way, informally, probably. Would that bring frowns over at Buckingham Palace? They just take what they get. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> she'd rather be Princess Sarah, I think, really, than Princess Andrew or Princess Andy. It is much worse. <laughs> we just saw the other members of the royal family come out of the um, confessor's chapel, and we would expect the happy couple to be leaving any moment now that Arlene Auger has completed her work. And now that the sun is out full force, the, it weather, is. the weather has been a good omen for these newlyweds. 
Americans go on a bit with your singing, don't you? Uh, yeah, blame us. Thank you very much. I think Mozart should be given credit for this. It is interesting. I mean, while we were inside, we should tell you a little bit of what's been going on with the weather here. We um, we brought out the umbrellas. Uh, we got touched a little bit by, by some of the moisture in the air. The winds got terrible. It got awful cold. But now, as soon as she's about to, to leave Westminster Abbey, the sun is broken through yet again. What do you people do with this stuff? It's, it's an English summer's day for an English rose, isn't it? Uh, it is lovely. You reminded me, speaking earlier, about how... Oh, right, she fumbled ever so slightly his name. Do you remember five years ago when Diana did muff Charles' yes, name? Yes, she did muff it. It was and very charming, though. I think people liked her for getting it wrong. One of the two of you remarked, I don't remember which, somewhat later in the service, Charles uh, stumbled. And one of you suggested gallantly, I thought, that he had done that on purpose to make her feel more comfortable, so both of them could be cited as having muffed it a bit. Which of you suggested that? You I, I don't know. I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> now, now nobody wants to be blamed, you see? It's the kind of chivalrous thing he might do. <laughs> he was very protective of Diana during that whole period, because at that time she was such a blushing, virginal little girl, really, as one can see from the old clips, mm -hmm. whereas Sarah is a very much more self-possessed, equal partner. And this is much more of a partnership, I think, between the, the two of them. And uh, whereas uh, Lady Di used to say, well, I should be all right with my husband beside me, um, Prince Andrew last night on television was talking about the way in which he expected his wife to help him and teach him all sorts of things he didn't know about the realities of life, for example. Flipping the coin over, I saw the note of the morning paper, in fact, that she's thinking of, of learning to fly or learning something about flying. So Sarah that, seems uh, to be almost a, a typical Cosmo girl. Mm -hmm. She's decided that she has to learn everything that her man does. But and she's going to take flying lessons for that reason. You know, we, uh, maybe we should get into this a little bit later, Tina, but I, th I think we might have a minor disagreement. Yes, she did emphasize she wanted to fly so that she and her husband could have something to talk about at dinner so they could share his work. But her first reason, she said, A, was the achievement. Yes, I believed it. She said that with great uh -huh. conviction. I think so, too. What, the achievement of what? Of flying? The personal flying. achievement. This is a woman who, for the sense of personal achievement, wants to learn to fly. And there's a great I deal. she'd want to learn to fly, though, if she wasn't marrying <laughs> Ace. <laughs> <laughs> We've moved back into uh, Westminster Abbey where Arlene Auger has now completed her work. I uh, jumped in a little bit earlier previously. I apologize. We are told that the Duke and Duchess of York, or Prince Andrew and the Princess Andrew, are still in the Confessor's Chapel. So we are still waiting for them to, to reappear and lead the exit procession from Westminster Abbey. And they will travel the route um, back towards Buckingham Palace, uh, just backtrack the path they took earlier this morning, now some, oh, hour and a half ago. We heard there to look at there is the whole royal family in a what row. What must the air be like in there? I mean, is, is it tense or is it a fairly happy occasion? No, I'm sure it's pretty, pretty relaxed. Um, the other night, the um, night before last, Ronnie Ferguson gave a party, his own contribution, because, of course, normally it's the bride's father who pays for the occasion, and on this occasion, of course, it's the royal family who do so. He gave a marvellous party last couple of nights ago at Smith's Lawn, his polo field. And apparently the Queen and Prince Philip were boogieing away like mad until the small hours of the morning. <laughs> Princess Anne and Mark Phillips had a flaming row. I mean, it sounds like a real wild party, actually. What over? Oh, well, that will be Princess Anne what? Go ahead. You can follow that up if you'd <laughs> like, Tina. I mean, don't leave it hanging. Well, Princess Anne seemed to be flirting over much with a couple of the gentlemen there, and Mark Phillips showed his displeasure rather obviously. Princess so it was a real family occasion. <laughs> Spoken like a gentleman, I like that. In keeping with that, I guess we should, in all fairness, go back to something that was said a little bit earlier, when it was said that, uh, oh, there they come, out of the Confessor's Chapel. We see the bride with her veil back for the first time. And she has, in fact, switched tiaras. She went in wearing flowers, and she comes out wearing, I think, a proper tiara. Lent to her by a friend, I think, isn't it? something borrowed. She did a costume switch in the chapel. Then she's curtsying to the queen, her new mother-in-law. 
How many American brides can do that? <laughs> well, she's going to continue to live with her new mother-in-law for a little while. So. That's right, while Andrew completes his um, uh, pilot training. She has a very good relationship with the Queen, and uh, apparently Princess Diana, when she goes to the palace to use the heated swimming pool, doesn't usually call in to see the Queen. But uh, the new Duchess of York always makes sure she looks in on the Queen. Is Diana closer to the Queen Mother? No, I think that's a myth. Um, really? In fact, I, I'm told it was the other way around, that um, Diana moved into Clarence House with the Queen Mother and couldn't stand it and, and moved out very quickly again. It's interesting to see her hair free-flowing because there are a number of people, having seen the formal pictures, were worried that she might truss it up. It's a very good idea, I think, to leave it long. Those are not uh, the, the faces of tense people. They were sort of relieved, happy people. Accent on the relieved. Wow. Good shot of her right there. did play less of a role though in this marriage than the last one because although the Princess of Wales is not close to her particularly now, nonetheless it was the Queen Mother who kind of engineered the last match because her lady-in-waiting, Lady Fomoy, is Princess Diana's grandmother. She they're, always liked Diana very much. They're right behind. You can see Prince William in the sailor hat, little Prince William. <laughs> He's such a good boy. He has been very good. I mean, as the uh, as the father of a three-year-old, and Jane, you should partake of this too, it is very difficult to control a little one in church. So maybe badly behaved might have been a little tough on him, but uh, he's done well today. Is that the midshipman's hat supposed to be worn at such a um, No, he's not a midshipman. Angle? The two elder ones are midshipmen. He's just an ordinary rating, an ordinary sailor. But nonetheless, is the hat supposed to be tipped back? Yes, I think it is. It's probably the first moment they can take in their friends in the congregation. Perhaps you saw a little bit earlier, yes, that was Elton John in the middle of your picture. He is among the invited guests. And yes, he was dressed for the occasion. They do have a very strange assortment of show business friends. One of their closest friends seems to be David Frost, who is married to the Duke of uh, Norfolk's daughter, and for that reason, she's a friend of Fergie. Other than uh, Mrs. Reagan, are you aware of, of Americans in the crowd at all? I don't think so, no. The, there is the Canadian girlfriend of Prince Andrew, Sandy Jones. Uh, That's a good question. I'm not aware of any, you know, as we look over the list. And you'll hear still more cheers when the royal couple finally reaches the outer door of the Abbey and the crowd out here with us is able to see them firsthand. That will be a big moment and you can see them coming right up to the door now. Truly a royal romance. They have known each other since they were little children. It wasn't until last summer when Princess Diana, a friend of Sarah's, invited her to join the family at Royal Ascot that the two rediscovered each other, shall we say. And uh, I think it's fair to say this was a marvelous wedding ceremony that went without any major hitches, and here they are. The Duke and Duchess. waves from the newlyweds as they wait now for the open carriages to move into position right here in front of the famous abbey where so many royal occasions have taken place the new duke and duchess of york
we don't know, of course, what's going to happen to those little page boys and page girls because they're now going to be made to disappear and they're going to be taken back by car to Buckingham Palace where the first thing that's going to happen is they're all going to pose for the wedding photograph. And what hopes that they then get a chance for some food with a little candy thrown in for Absolutely. good behavior. Just as wiggly and squiggly as all of our children are for themselves. Uh, we can see it happening beneath us. You may see it on your screen in a minute, but those... Page boys and girls are going to have a great time in the second coach there. They're oh, all I'm running. sure they will. It must be great fun. That as they got in the carriage, um, Prince Andrew and and his bride, Sarah. He was he was taking on his first husbandly duty. He was yes. helping her with the train. Father, I just here, honey. Let me help. <laughs> <laughs> That'll last about two weeks. No, I'm just teasing. You no, know, I think he's going to be a good help. Me. Do you? Yes, I do. Some of the most delightful photographs last year were of the wind lifting the train and the little bridesmaids falling about all over it. Now, they, as we noted a little bit earlier, they will backtrack uh, to Buckingham Palace. They will return in the reverse order in which they arrive. Uh, the Queen left the palace first. She'll be the last to arrive. And uh, a couple you see right there are the last to arrive at Westminster Abbey. They're the first to leave. It is, after all, their day. She arrives in a glass coach. I guess that's to protect the, the bride. It's as if the bride arrived in a bell jar. And now it's uh, the, the top is down. And she's the got the royal up. wave down, doesn't yeah. she? Yeah, she looks already as though she's got a bit more stamina than her husband. There's no doubt that Sarah is for the man of born. She loves the public attention and she seems Does very she? relative. How long will that last? I think she's going to grow more and more into the park. It seems to me that she has a natural extrovert uh, flamboyance. And this is a, a, a fabulous job for her. In many ways, she probably could have been very good in PR. And this, in a way, is an extended PR job. Hmm. There's the queen with um, Major Ronnie Ferguson, the bride's father. <laughs> the kids are having a tell great me, time. Tell me. <laughs> I, the Prince Edward gets to ride back in one carriage with. with now, that is not the royal way. <laughs> and there, but there is another woman. I had written down her name somewhere. Mrs. Parker, I believe. Now, would she be. Prince William's nanny, because someone has to ride the carriage with these little, these little, little nanny Barnes. So I don't yeah. know who Miss Parker is. Perhaps she's a new nanny. Well, she's a grown-up, and she <laughs> must be fair in charge. I guess youngsters aren't supposed to have the royal wave down, right? You can just let it fly. That's the House of Parliament, of course, Big Ben, which is right beside Westminster Abbey. When do the uh, peels start? The three and a half hour. I think they have already started. Girls. We just can't hear them. The ones from St. Margaret's Chapel. Sarah is currently editing a book about the palaces of Westminster. When she began that project, she could scarcely, I think, have imagined that her own life would take this turn. There's the Major and the Queen. With Get Prince it. Philip and uh, Mrs. Barante is um, Sarah's mother behind. This is Susie? Is that what That's Susie right, is? Susie. Saucy Susie Barantes. I was we might add a little bit so we don't do her an injustice. While we had said a little bit earlier she had rather dumped him, there were rumors that she left because she was a little bit offended by some of his improprieties. So we'll give them equal time. <laughs> Quite a ladies' man, I think. That's nice. These are lovely pictures. This crowd is, um, has been very patient down here in, um, across the street from Buckingham Palace. They have been listening by public address system to the service, and when they got to the I do's of the service, they let out an applause, but they are anxiously waiting right now their, um, their first look at uh, Sarah Ferguson. Having just seen the carriage full of little ones, were you struck as, as I was in, in the course of the interview that we saw last night with her, which was charming and casual? Nobody mentioned kids. Nobody mentioned children. They talked about where they would live. They talked about pursuing well, their careers. There was, there was a rather sweet moment when they were examining the wedding presents, and Prince Andrew said, oh, let's save that, darling, for the children. For the children. Which was the only little giveaway. Because I think there's no doubt that uh, uh, they will have children just as soon as they can. It's in the royal tradition um, to prove they're fertile. I mean, let's not forget that's part of the business. Diana was so, was beginning her family one in September after her July wedding, wasn't she? We'll come back in just a moment. We are anxiously awaiting the, uh, the appearance of the newlyweds.
here uh, across the street from Buckingham Palace. They'll let out a roar when they see them. We'll come back and catch some of that right after these messages. <laughs> to the applause of the gathered multitudes, the, uh, the happy newlyweds are making their way back towards Buckingham Palace. Robert, go ahead. Yes, I was just noticing the confetti going down Sarah's dress that she was peering down for. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, know, you notice that. <laughs> Prince Andrew seemed to notice it too. <laughs> some of these people that you're seeing right there have been waiting up to 48 hours for this very glimpse that they're enjoying right now. Bob, uh, Tina, we're obviously uh, speaking to an American audience who is is enthralled with this as they are weddings in general. What are, what's, what's a British audience likely to feel watching a ceremony in the circumstances. Well, I felt a great lump in my throat, I must say, um, both at the time of the wedding and then at the national anthem. The sheer beauty, I think, of the ceremony is always so moving. I, the, the, the way they do things is so, they do it so well, there's no question. And the singing um, and the choice of hymns, I think it is an emotional thing. You're do you have to be a royalist to feel that way? No, I don't think so. I think one of the appeals of today is that um, there is, is, is the emotion that everybody experiences at a wedding for, for everybody to share. I think your feelings predominate, but there's no denying that this ceremony and, um, and some of the pomp and pageantry has had its critics. I mean, I, I saw one noted that these kind of occasions are generally reserved for heads of states of undemocratic nations, and, and others were saying that royalty was now being used as an anecdote for all of the ills <laughs> of sorry, Great Britain. But this there's is, a, this is a joyous day. Now, he's a future king of England, and he's a... Uh, getting in his practice already. <laughs> you see that there's Prince Edward who has left to mind the children. <laughs> Lady Rosanna Innes Kerr, the little blonde girl, is the daughter of the Duke and Duchess of Roxburgh. And it was their house, Floor's Castle, that uh, Prince Andrew proposed to Sarah. So she's there really. On both knees? In, on both knees. And it was there at Floor's Castle, I'm not, mis not mistaken, where they shot the Lord Greystoke, the Tarzan movie. <laughs> so That's true, too. That's true. Only in America. Yeah, well, exactly. well, what the heck? <laughs> Might have had a little baboon in that carriage. <laughs> <laughs> Monkey business, maybe. And there we see the queen and uh, the major. <coughs> Once again, you see, five years ago, it was so shocking for a divorced couple to be sitting beside the queen and Prince Philip, and uh, this year it seems quite normal. Now, she doesn't look as, as sober and serious as she did inside the abbey. She's <coughs> enjoying it, too. <coughs> What is quite interesting is that both uh, the Princes of Wales and the new Duchess of York both have mothers who, in fact, <coughs> left the family roost, which is quite an unusual thing. So in many ways, the royal family have had to get used to having these separated marriages. Well, they have um, divorce in the old home family, of course, with Princess, Princess Margaret. How is her stock, by the way, these days? She's more low-key. I think now that the Princess of Wales is such a star, there's less need, in a way, for the press to centre on Princess Margaret. There was a long time where, since they couldn't really write about the Queen in the same way, <coughs> Princess Margaret, in a sense, bore the flag, as it were, for being the one they could write about. But uh, she seems in very good form, I think. Her health is not a, a, a question she had... I think she'll never give up smoking, and she should, mm -hmm. because she's been ill. But like her father, she's an incurable smoker, and she's going to go on smoking, I think, until she drops. Incurable smoker. Well put. <laughs> I'm not sure if they're coming into our um, in the view of our naked eye here. Obviously, we can see them well, can on the our monitors, but we up. can hear the crowd building up. That's why I'm trying to look through the trees and see just just how close they are to the palace. From that shot, I would gather they're still about uh, 200 yards from being even with us. Why don't you just watch television here, Brian? You can watch the monitors. I'm going to turn around and see if I can see them. <laughs> With my yeah. own eyes. He's still a good three hours from our view. <laughs> what was the story that was uh, the, the legendary BBC commentator, Richard Dimbleby, Here they paused are. in the service and, and they thought it was a meaningful pause. He was shooting home movies. <laughs> I, I feel much the same. Listen way. to this. They have just arrived um, here in the roundabout leading up to Buckingham Palace and the Victoria Memorial.
deafening outpouring of emotion here just outside of Buckingham Palace as um, Andrew and Sarah, Prince Andrew and Sarah make their way on back to the palace. Some of these people have been waiting forever just for that one shot. I'd like, Cameras out in force. I'd like to apologize to the Duke of York, too. When I said spontaneously, I see her. I'm sorry, but why do, I, uh, why do we... <laughs> there's the bride, and who's that with her? That's all right. Good news <laughs> and bad news. Small key affair, in a way, because this isn't a, a real royal wedding. It's not the heir to the throne that Nancy has come over here. And yet 43 million people worldwide being brought this live television coverage, uh, which certainly says something about the whole institution. There they are, just going into the palace now, the bride and groom, where an excellent sure. luncheon awaits. Oh, 300, 300 million. million. 300 million people worldwide. By our quantum. Now, here they are coming into the palace, to Buckingham Palace. I think it's called a wedding breakfast, isn't it? What, yes, what they're about to have, although it's lunchtime here already. They're having some lamb as their main course, and the wine, of course, starts off with French champagne. Very expensive, 25 pounds a bottle, but I imagine the Queen can just about afford just that. About afford. One point about. we haven't made here is that Major Ferguson is a very lucky man that he hasn't got to foot the bill for his daughter's wedding. It's another advantage of uh, having your daughter marry one of the monarch's sons here. But before any of that, they are going to be arranged in the great state room and into there, a group. There's Mrs. And Reagan. There is Nancy Reagan. cheers from the crowd outside here at Westminster Abbey. And in accordance with Nancy's position as the wife of the president, she is given the first car to leave after the royal family and the other guests who are involved with the bride and groom. And here the bride and groom are inside the Buckingham Palace area now. They will be going in for the wedding breakfast. About a hundred guests are going to attend that breakfast. A lot of close family members and foreign dignitaries. The venue was supposed to have been kept secret, I'm told. Mm. It did get out that it was lamb and, and Jersey one new the, potatoes. Uh, one of the next big events will be the appearance on the balcony, which uh, I think I'm right is scheduled for about half an hour from now. This is probably the most sought-after invitation, the wedding breakfast, because there's 40 members of the royal family and 30 members of the Ferguson family. It doesn't leave many over. They can fit a lot more people than that in there. Come. And now the Duke oh, the and Duchess of York will go inside after they get the 17 and a half feet of train from behind Sarah. And it's taking several it to people somewhere. to do that. And while they get the train in order and go inside, little kisses to the little royals. Kisses all around. <laughs> <laughs> That's the fun part. That's the fun part. She's still beaming. That is a flattering gown. I am waiting for the consensus that your people, your newspapers, the media, as they call it, can be, they wouldn't be unhesitating to be critical if they thought the dress was a failure. Well, they've been incredibly mean about Sarah's figure. But I do think this dress is a triumph. It makes her very slim. Jane, didn't you tell me the other day that within two hours after the ceremony, these dresses would be in the store? Oh, someone is snitching, uh, snipping and clipping even as we speak, as I reach for my umbrella. And as, the, um, <laughs> as Queen Elizabeth and the Queen Mother make their way back into the palace, let's go on over to Buckingham Palace, where our correspondent Henry Champ is standing by. Henry. Yes, Brian, I'm with uh, one of the very many Americans here. Charlotte Sheehy from Huntsville, Alabama. What did you think? Oh, I thought it was great. I was, it's unbelievable. And what did you come here for to see? And what just, did you... To see everybody, to see all the royal family and just the pageantry. And I noticed you were nearly falling over the fence to get a picture of Fergie. Will that be the big moment? Uh, yes, we can't wait till they come out on the balcony. That's what we're waiting for next, so. Tim, if you can bring your camera down, I think, Brian, we can probably show you one of the youngest Americans who's certainly here watching, and that's Caitlin, who is two months old, who has been here the majority of the night just to watch this event. Okay, Henry. Brian. All right, Henry, thank you very much. And very loud applause right here as the, uh, the Queen is making her way into Buckingham Palace. 
almost the entire procession has now reached us. And that balcony scene that um, the young American was talking about when they come out on the balcony is now just about uh, 35 minutes away. And Bryant, I'm told that the, uh, the BBC has pronounced the wedding gown and the bride a, a, a success, a triumph. So we can all rest easy now. Does that end the <laughs> debate then? I think it does. I'd go along with that. Yeah. Well, I think the dieting did pay off. The, no, she the denied. The she denied. Yeah. Paid off. Well, she said she wasn't on a diet. Yeah. Which bride is not on a diet? Though I think Princess Anne wins the hat derby. Yes, she looks extremely elegant in that yellow. See, there we are. No, no, it's Mrs. Barante. Oh, oh, Mrs. Barante. Oh no, no, it's Mrs. Anne is in yellow too. <laughs> the mother of the bride. No wonder the Princess hat Anne looks so good. She's Mrs. Barante. Yeah. Well, Princess Anne was wearing yellow. She is in yellow. She's in the yellow hat and the yellow suit. What is the consensus here? I mean, I, I, you two have floated around it. Was she or was she not on a diet? She was definitely on a diet. No question. She, in fact, she went to a health farm for a week to try and lose it. I just don't think she'd lie to us, Tina. I believe <laughs> this girl was incapable of telling a fib. What does that mean? You're saying she wasn't on a diet? No, I think she was, was very nervous and was probably, her metabolism was racing. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. <laughs> Currently, Princess Anne is constantly force feeding her. Prince Andrew, rather, is, is constantly force feeding her with profiteroles. So. Listen, I don't mean this to be ugly because I happen to think Prince Andrew was a, was a really good looking young man. But I noticed in the, that uh, last night, at least in the interview they shot before, he was the one that had a little, maybe one extra chin I hadn't noticed before, little love handles. They become him, I don't think. It's like critical, but. It was a new haircut. What? It was a new haircut. It's an unbecoming <laughs> new haircut he had, especially for the wedding. Gave him an extra that chin. Was not, that was not a graceful exit from the carriage by the Major, but that's all right. We knew what he meant. Well, how much and practice have you had? I don't know. Disembarking but I mean, from carriages. But, but to come out on one foot and kind of do a jig as you get there, but that's all right. Delphinium blue and dove gray shoes, if you're watching in color. We'll come back in just a moment with much more from London, right after this. We are looking at the, uh, the village of Dummer in Hampshire, about uh, 50 miles northwest of here, where the bells, we are told, are pealing there now. The bells of St. Margaret's are also pealing. You were asking about them earlier. And yes, most of the crowd is making its way on up this way in order to um, to see some of that balcony scene. We might add also that they'll be allowed a little bit later in Westminster Abbey to uh, to take a look. So some of these people won't be going home for a while yet. The Union Jack very much in evidence on this day. It is um, on T-shirts and hats and all, all manner of things. We might say, though, that there were no, no, at least I didn't see any, no uh, Fergie and Andy T-shirts, right? No, no, the, the, the souvenirs this year have been disappointingly tasteful. And, uh... <laughs> I, I did see a T-shirt. A, a fellow claimed he'd sold 20,000 of them. It was, and it was tastefully done. That al is not with palace approval. Not with palace approval, but it was the pal official palace photograph emblazoned in a heart with, with Sarah and Andrew, and it was just lovely. And I'd like to point out, as I twirl my little royal blue umbrella, that not a drop of rain that is falling on me fell on the bride. She was well inside the courtyard at Buckingham Palace before a drop fell. But then there are those of us who would argue that the drops are falling right now, but that's okay. We've been through this argument before. Here, we did let it. me brush off this non we did it. Drop. We did it on the boat. We can do it in London. We're going to come back in just a moment, right after a break. This is a special edition of Today on NBC. Of course, Brian, if you look at We're back in London. You are looking at uh, Trafalgar Square, and if it looks empty, it's because it is. A lot of people have rushed on up this way. They are waiting for um, very much the same thing that we're waiting for, and that's to uh, the rain to, start. to see <laughs> to see the <laughs> the Duke and Duchess of York make an, an appearance on the balcony, and he will probably kiss his his new bride. I have a question for Bob. The uh, uh, marriage ceremony, of course, featured uh, endowing his his new wife with, quote, all his worldly goods. How, um, tell me 
me about the, the, the Duke of York's assets. In the interview last night that, that they gave to British television, he spoke in terms of his wife's wardrobe as, in effect, give us a break. It's, this is not a bottomless pit of money, and we have to make do. How, how wealthy is this young man? Well, I think he was rather eager last night to scotch all the rumors that all the royal dresses come free from the dressmakers which they is a, is, is a touchy subject. Prince Andrew, of course, is not nearly so wealthy as Prince Charles. From the day Prince Charles was born, he had an income coming in from the Duchy of Cornwall, as it's called, which is a group of estates mainly in the west of England. Prince Andrew has nothing like that, and I think their chief asset is going to be the wedding present they get from the Queen. She is going to give them a house. Let me butt in for just one moment, because what we're seeing right there is not a reenactment of the invasion of 1066, <laughs> but instead it is uh, some of that crowd that we had talked about a little bit earlier making their way up the mall back towards Buckingham Palace so that they can catch a sight of uh, Prince Andrew and his bride on the balcony. Last year I remember watching a similar sight with Peter Ustinov in the green room, who was one of the guests, and he'd been going to sleep and he suddenly woke up at this particular moment and said, good God, it's the Russian Revolution. <laughs> They're coming for us. And there's the balcony where they will, they will emerge for what we hope is the kiss. Let me give a, um, a, a quick nod to the crowd because this, this has been an extremely well-behaved group. Uh, we did see just before we went on the air a couple of people being led away. We saw somebody else being carried off in a stretcher who evidently had taken a, a bit of a fall. But beyond that, this, this crowd has been extremely, extremely extremely well behaved and it's not small on the subject of money much has been made of the fact that sarah is going to continue to work after she's married but i think that's a fairly unrealistic desire for those of you who may have joined us uh, just a little bit late by now prince andrew and sarah ferguson have become man and wife this is a little bit of what happened no oh, less than an hour ago now as they exchanged vows christian edward take the sarah mug Take thee, Sarah Margaret. To my wedded wife. <coughs> to my wedded wife. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. Till death us do part. Till death us do part. I, Sarah Margaret. I, Sarah Margaret. Take thee, Andrew Albert Christian Edward. Take thee, Andrew Albert Christian, Christian Edward. To my wedded husband. To my wedded husband. To have and to hold. And this is to done have and to hold. In this day forward. Sorry, as soon as we come off this, we're going to lose. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love, cherish, and to obey. To love, cherish, and to obey. Till death us do part. Till death us do part. And with that, the two are joined in storybook fashion. What we are seeing here in, um, in the square around Buckingham Palace is a huge throng. Some of these people have made their, their way up the mall, the mall from uh, Trafalgar Square, where they had been waiting much of the day. And as you can see, led by um, Bobbies and uh, security officers on horseback, they are now making their way into the roundabout around Victoria Mall in order to get a better position. And what they are waiting for is the shot that many of us are here, and that is the scene when um, Prince Andrew and his bride will make their appearance on that balcony to greet the crowd. They'll do so for about 10 minutes, and then they'll start to disperse. Military servicemen often form special bonds. One of Prince Andrew's mates who served with him aboard the HMS Brazen now joins us this morning from Westminster Abbey. He is leading hand Paul Haig, who now serves on the HMS Daedalus. And good morning, sir. Good morning. Alongside the uh, Royal Route, you were one of the guards of honor. Were you very much at ease, or was this a day of work for you? Um, I think it was more, more of a work day for us, really. Um, just standing there at attention being dead proud. You served with Andrew, or H as he was known, on, on the brazen. Are yes. you surprised to see him getting married at this stage of his life? Yes, I am. I, I didn't know anything about it, to be, to, to be honest with you. Um, but I'm not surprised he's getting married. Um, I think it's good. Did he strike you as the marrying kind? Um, 
Yeah, I think so, eventually, yes. When you thought of, uh, of Prince Andrew and, and talked with him, knowing him as you did, is Sarah the kind of girl you always imagined for him, or are you a bit surprised by his selection? Well, I didn't really think about the women he was, he was to be marrying, like. I, 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 wasn't, uh, I wasn't that interested. I was just interested in doing my job and, and just being proud of being on the flight with him. What was it like to... Um, to serve with Prince Andrew. Did he ever allow you to forget that he was of royal blood? Yes, yes, he did. He, he, he was just one of the officers. He just let Tret, he's just been Tret like a, a normal officer. And it was great, I, I really enjoyed it. It was an experience for me that I shall never forget. When he first entered the Royal Naval College at Dartmouth, he was viewed as, as brash and arrogant. What happened between then and now to have reversed that judgment so universally? Um, I think from stories that I hear before, um, it must have matured a lot on, on, on HMS Brazen because, like I say, I can't fault the guy. He's, uh, he's all right. He's a good bloke. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you married? Yes, I am, yes. How tough is life uh, of a Navy wife going to be for um, Sarah Ferguson, his new bride? I, I really couldn't say because um, I'm just a... a, a, a uh, a rating, whereas Prince Andrew is an uh, officer. So I couldn't really tell you. Paul Haig, you've had a busy day. Thank you for taking some time to spend it with us. Thank you. We'll come back in just a moment. Much more from London on a special edition of today, right after this. And you can see some of the crowd moving on up to the palace gates in order to catch a glimpse of uh, Prince Andrew and his new bride, Sarah Ferguson. If only they knew that Willard Scott has scooped them all. Back at Trafalgar Square, Willard has actually found the royal couple. Mr. Scott, hey, that's actually Brian, pretty good. Isn't that something? That's this, amazing. This is Rona Willard, and I have an exclusive report. This is my first exclusive from Lord Nelson. As we look down Whitehall, I have the new Duchess of York and the Duke of York, and congratulations, sir. Thank you, Elon. And thank you so much. Uh, Duchess, uh, this is the first time. Would you show the ring? We've never seen the ring on television. Can you zoom in right? tight on the ring there? The cameraman is the camera person. <laughs> that is, isn't that lovely? Now, you two guys have, without question, the greatest act in the entire world right now. You've been all over the country. Uh, you've been all over Europe. Europe and right. your real name, of course, is Keith Hemstock. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> well, of course. This is, this is Keith with the teeth. Show them the teeth, Keith. OK. Teeth is Prince Andrew. And of course, incredibly, I mean, the likeness is incredible. This is Keith Hemstock. And you are really, uh, what do you do for a living? I'm a news agent when I'm not doing this. Incredible. How'd they find you? I found myself. I mean, he, he grew to look like me, and yeah. it just took off. That's incredible. Yeah. Have you ever met each other? No, not yet. And, well, I want to miss Giselle Birdingham, right? That's correct, yeah. I want to make sure I get that correct. Thank Where you. do you live? I actually live in Croydon, which is London. And you told me, because I talked to you a lot more than I talked to him, because I like you better than I do him anyway. Because you're pretty. So. You're, <laughs> yes, you're definitely a, a girl. The fact that you're a model, right? That's correct, yes. And you thought you did, and you went into an agency and said, what do you think? Yes, that's right. And they said, fantastic. I was working. And, are oh. anything going between you two? I mean, has something happened? No, we're spoken for. Oh, that's too bad. I mean, from someone else. Are you married? I'm married, yes. I mean, and you're married? Yes. Very good. Well, congratulations. You're both the most, the incredible look-alike of the century right here. Sarah, or Fergie, and Andy. Keith uh, Hemstock and uh, Giselle Burningham. Okay, Jane is back in the palace, and that's where Jane belongs because she's every inch a queen. That guy does an incredible Willard close. Scott imitation. Yeah, he doesn't really he? does, doesn't he? Remarkable. You know, she looks remarkably like like Sarah. He didn't smile enough. No, he's he, it's a little close. Maybe yeah. maybe Andrew with a beard, and if he grew his, maybe they can get away with it. But she's she's definitely got a future. What do you say? Well, let's go out a uh, little pause in the country. Uh, NBC's Stephen Fraser is standing by in the bride's home village, Dama. Stephen. Good morning, Jane. We'd like to show you the church where Sarah might have been married if she'd married a commoner rather than her prince. This is All Saints Church in Dummer. It's just big enough for about 80 people, so you see it would have been inadequate for today's festivities uh, if anybody had had ideas about holding the wedding here. I'm joined by Kate and Barry Dodd, who uh, Kate is a lifelong resident of Dummer, and um, you had a chance, I understand, to see the, the ceremony on television. So what was it like for you? Yes, we've been watching on, it on television this morning, and it brought tears to the eyes. She looked absolutely gorgeous, just how we remembered her. I mean, I played with her as a small child and learnt to swim and ride a pony on the farm, so it brought back very lots and lots of memories and a few tears in the eyes, so we were very, very 
overwhelmed to see her there today. Barry, is she still a local girl, or has she grown up and gone to the big city and never come back? Oh, no, she's been back, but uh, obviously, well, now, it's going to be a, a lot different now. Um, it's going to be very difficult to come back, even at the local fete, you know, the press and um, everybody else around. It's um, very difficult for her to move around. But no, she's still the same, same girl as I remember. Well, thanks very much for joining us here. As you can see, the celebrations are uh, getting a little louder with the ringing <laughs> of the church bell, so we'll go back to you now where you might hear a little better. All right, Stephen, thank you very much. Uh, the, uh, the pride of Dummer is set to make an appearance on the balcony with her new husband in about, oh, five or six minutes. We're going to come back and catch some of that, but first we'll take a break here. This is Today on NBC. back now across the street from Buckingham Palace for those of you uh, along our line who may be just joining us and are going to be breaking uh, for local news we'll be getting to that shortly but we are all sitting here awaiting the um, the appearance on the balcony of the Duke and Duchess of York let us reintroduce everyone uh, to my left is Viscount Charles Althrop he is uh, the Princess of Wales younger brother along with Jane Pauley I'm Brian Gumbel Tina Brown has joined us she's the editor of Vanity Fair and to her right is Robert Lacey a well-known author here in Great Britain Brian I have a question world. A frequent visitor to today. How many other titles should I tell you? <laughs> yeah, Go ahead. I'm sorry. I have sorry. a question for Charles, if I might. I asked you to find out something for us the other day, and I don't know if you've uh, been able to follow up on it, but have you been able to learn when the Duke and Duchess of York might come to America? Well, I couldn't find it out, I'm afraid. There's no immediate plans, I don't think. <laughs> it's not on their honeymoon route. No. You heard us earlier quibbling about whether or not she is now the Princess Andrew or the Duchess of York. Um, can she still be the Princess Andrew? No, um, that's a very definite title. I think as a royal um, duchess, she is a, a, a considered a princess, but not in name. She's not Princess Andrew, like uh, Prince Michael is married to Princess Michael. It's a very definite title. Princess Michael absolutely detests being called Princess Michael and but, yearns to be called Princess Marie Christine, which is her name. But she's stuck with that rather But she detests supercar. quite a bit, doesn't she? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as I recall, she detests the press for a while, too. We were to blame for every, uh, every manner of problem there was on Earth. We're looking down at, uh, at uh, Victoria Memorial just outside of Buckingham Palace. You can see how the people have gathered here for what uh, should be coming up in, what, about a minute? According to our schedule, everything has been pretty much on schedule. I can't help but, uh, but, but not compare, but be reminded of America's recent spectacular. Uh, Bob, you were there for Liberty Weekend, and you were at least in in country, weren't you? Iacocca Day. Yeah, yes. Iacocca Day. <laughs> uh, Tina, I'm afraid. No, you were there I, too, I was there. Of I think it's a great relief, I must admit, not to have uh, Frank Sinatra and Bob Hope wheeled out, but maybe that the next <laughs> royal wedding they'll be there. Well, as a matter of fact, and I wasn't going to name names, but 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 what is missing here? Uh, for, from an American spectacular are the movie stars. I guess when you've got royalty, you don't need movie well, there stars. Were, there were a few. There was uh, people like Elton John were in the, um, they were in, in Westminster Abbey. Right? Also, I was about to say that as I was going through the, oh, I heard some something behind me i thought we were missing something as i was going through the royal release and they were talking about the photographer who was going to be shooting um as point of introduction they said he has shot clint eastwood warren Beatty, elizabeth <laughs> taylor among others i mean in instead of listing royalty they did list the movie but stars, even, so. even so i mean you would have if this had been an american wedding the shots would have been of um elizabeth and, and bob and yeah. yeah, the only two close-ups, really, aside from the, um, the royals that we had inside Westminster Abbey were one of Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher and the other one of Elton John. And Mrs. Mrs. Reagan, too. I did not see that they had a close-up of her. What, did the they? Service. Am I making that no, up? No, we did see Elton. We saw Elton John. Yes. And, and we Mrs. Saw, Reagan and we did see Mrs. Reagan. Well, the yes. But mostly they centered on, the, on the family, on, on people like Mrs. Barantes and Princess Anne and all the rest Which of the Which is as it should family. be, right? I think people are rather curious about what the family of the bride looked like and the family of the, of, of the bridegroom. I'd just like to, uh, from an insider's uh, point of view, explain why this might be the only part of the day which might not come as clockwork. As I remember the photographs last time, they just seemed to go on and on and on, these different groups. And then at the end, you get these very frivolous photographs which are kept by the family. And I think one or two were released last time. But they can't really, cater, uh, they don't know how long it's going to take. It just happens. Now, they, well, you there for it's that yeah. well known, that wonderful. Yes, yeah. Was it Litchfield they, took that photograph? I'm sorry. That's sorry. Who blew a whistle? I can't remember. But it, I think it's Litchfield. <laughs> he blew it a whistle to get everyone's attention because there's so many of us. There are about 45 in the big one. <laughs> They've been back for almost a half hour. What are they doing in there? 
Uh, well, most people are getting bored having drinks, and then the others are uh, having photographs taken. They're getting shunted off in different groups. It's quite it's interesting that this year the photographer is not Lord Litchfield. The choice of photographer is Albert Watson, who is a fashion photographer. And my only query is, can he handle this kind of group? Because Lord Litchfield has the authority of being the Queen's cousin. In a way, he could sort of take over and blow his whistle and not feel at all. In other words, this one may get pushed around a little bit. He might bit. get a little bit more. We'll phased. find out tomorrow because he's going to be a guest on today. How's that for cross-reference? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know? <laughs> Thank you very much, dear. You did real good. <laughs> well, well, what do you say if, if um, the Queen is in the wrong position or not looking the right way? I mean, it's, uh, I know what Lord Litchfield, up, everybody. <laughs> last year, Lord Litchfield had numbers painted on the floor, didn't he? And he, everybody, as everybody came in, he gave them a number and just told them to go to the place. Yes, everyone had a pretty good idea of what was expected. Now, he'd worked it out, got the heights right, got the sort of right groupings of family, royalty, whatever. Which Were you difficult. satisfied with, uh, with how he uh, uh, captured you? You in the... uh, well, it was, I was just a very small face at the back, I think. <laughs> That's just walk on, but... The penalty of being six foot, six foot three, I suppose. Let me, <laughs> let me once again, not to repeat myself, but it's, but it's worth noting again for our viewers along the line, yes, we are coming up on your local cut-in for your news, and we will get to it, but we are, uh, again, awaiting a, a moment of, of great drama, frankly, and, and the people here thoroughly enjoy, and that is the appearance on that balcony of the Duke and Duchess of York, and they will appear there and do little hugs and kisses and waves for, what, about 10 <laughs> minutes? I reckon that's, I mean, they that's just do... Hugs and uh, kisses for 10 minutes? Five minutes, and then, the, I mean, they'll, <laughs> they'll go out first, probably, and then the Queen and Prince Philip, and then the Ferguson parents will come out, I should think. I think that's what happened last time. And, and the reason we keep spinning around is we hear the crowd erupting, but evidently the crowd is calling for it. Yes, that's right. You'll hear a great cheer and we want Fergie or something. <laughs> I Shanted. suspect it'll be a bit more demonstrative, though, than when the Prince and Princess of Wales came up, because as I recall, the Prince of Wales had to almost be sort of cajoled into kissing Princess of Wales. Whereas I was I a suspect little... But that's in keeping with his character, isn't it, Robert? this couple, you can't stop them kissing each other. I mean, they, they had a whole sequence on the BBC last night. Right. It looked like um, a music video in slow motion of the couple kissing to a love song. What about the, the, the final shot? I wish we had, we, we could roll it, but uh, Andy gives uh, Sarah a swat on, how we say here, I've been here a week, I'll say it a bum. Gives her a swat on the bum and she turns around and gives him one right back. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of horseplay, I suspect, in this relationship. <laughs> and you do feel a little foolish, admit it. Um, enjoying a wedding like this so much and awaiting the kiss like this but it's I think there are some occasions when journalists and everybody else can admit I'm a sucker for fireworks and I'm a sucker for wedding it's, a, it's deliciously corny yeah this is a very public dimension to it I mean as we were sitting here the service was being relayed and at the moment when she said I do a great big cheer went up from everybody here as though it was a football match and as Jane was quick to note, when she did say obey, a dark cloud came over to the sun. <laughs> yes. But then that's my partner's bed. That's all right, though. I did, Actually, I, I let's didn't tell fight the it. truth. You said that. You are projecting, Brian. I did, you I said didn't, that. I didn't fight it. Yeah. What are the sensitivities of those involved when they come out on the balcony? I mean, are they pretty much aware that when the, when the crowd is yelling, Sarah, Sarah, it's not necessarily they're choosing Sarah over the others, just this is Sarah's day? That's right. I mean, there won't, there won't be any hard feelings today. I mean, it is her day. But if it happens tomorrow... <laughs> Then we got a real problem, right? Is anyone put, put off that uh, Charles' sister, as I said before, probably is the most famous woman in the world today? And tell me who's number two, even. But is there is there any kind of between the two girls? But no, 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 no. I don't think there is. I think they're friends, and I think Sarah's. Right? But is there any feeling that um, this has gone too far? I don't think so. I think she wears her superstardom with great elegance. And I think people just love looking at her. She has that extraordinary star quality, rather like Marilyn Monroe and, and then Jackie Kennedy as well. People just love to look at her. They just cannot have enough of her. How does she feel about it, Charles? She's very relaxed about it. It certainly hasn't gone to her head. I haven't noticed any great changes, any more than you expect from someone growing up from being 20 to 25. I think she's done really well. Were you proud of your nephew? Oh, he looked great, yeah. And that, he, he was with my niece, you see, and I saw that she, he was, he was veering off to the left quite dramatically at one point, but she pulled him back. <laughs> now, was he, was he pulling her or was she pulling him? Oh, she, she would have been in charge. She oh, really? Pulled him back, yeah. Because oh. we were speculating that it was the other way around. It looked like he had a, a firm lock on that hand and wasn't well, able to... Well, he was trying to pull her ahead and she was trying to be dignified and, 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 and majestic in, in her realm. Um, March. Right. I can see, but she's no. I, she struck me as being in charge, as he was listing the delay. Were you surprised by anything as it transpired inside the Abbey? No, it all no. looked fairly standard. You know, I mean, not that these happen very often, but that's exactly what uh, most people would have expected. I feel. 
I think that Prince Andrew has taken a big hand in choosing the photographers that are going to take the pictures because he himself is a great photography buff. And in many ways, it was quite adventurous of him to not use either Lord Snowden or Lord Litchfield. You know, the fact that they are now six minutes uh, behind schedule for the first time today, maybe um, points out what you were talking about a little bit earlier, that yeah. uh, perhaps someone without a title, especially an American, might have some difficulty telling everybody where they have to stand and please give me your attention pretty please. See, the I'm surprise trying to remember Norman what... Parkinson didn't take the photographs because Norman Parkinson was quite a friend of Andrew's and had really helped him with his photography and I suspect that he wasn't used because of his great friendship with Coo Stark. Perhaps he was felt that it was a little bit too close. It's interesting. I was, was thinking about trying to recall five years ago. It seems like we were kept waiting a bit then too. This is a family wedding. And, and as uh, Charles has, has pointed out, that's a family group in there. And on, on, the, on the wedding day, maybe, oh, maybe they oh, have... Oh, I'm going to jump off and differ with you right here because the royal family has orchestrated this thing to the teeth, gradually releasing item by item in order to get the most publicity value possible you don't out think, of it. You at don't the very think this final, is a dramatic oh, moment? But at the very final time to suddenly turn around and say, well, it's a family affair, we'll do it as we please, no, 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 I think no. is really out of character. But, 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 but you don't mean to imply that it would be more dramatic to be on schedule, shall we say. I think that they are waiting, building up the suspense, build up the drama, and let, let the schedule... Yeah. If, you, if you think about this, this is the one part of the day where they're not relying on somebody else's timekeeping. This is very much up to them when they feel they've had enough photographs done. All the way, you've had colonels leading their troops at the right moment, yes. and they're going to get it right. And now it's the royal family up to themselves. Right. They'll be shocked What are you saying? They're going to get, get it wrong? Get one of me and my crown. <laughs> and what is it, Brian? I mean, the, 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 the couple has, doesn't have to run to catch a plane on time. No, the I plane understand. is not going to leave I'm without I'm just saying, them. I mean, it, is, it, is, it, would be, it would be ridiculous at this point to claim, hey, it's a private affair, when they have orchestrated this thing to the teeth for publicity value. No, I don't know about that. They want to get their own snaps, though, in the way they want them. I mean, there's going to be a... You know, let's get one of the, you know, the little boy and so on. I think people like to orchestrate their own photographs. Robert? Yes, there's a whole... I'm, I, I talked to Litchfield about it last year. I mean, he was up on a stepladder blowing a whistle all the time, and uh, he had worked it out. I think he had to start with everybody, and then he peeled off one set of people, and then he peeled off another set, and then he just finished up with the, the bride and groom and the attendants. Well, for those of you expecting your local news along our line, um, I hate to be like a little boy who cried wolf, but ultimately, yes, you are going to get it. We are going to be breaking away for it, and obviously our schedule is um, a little different than what you have grown accustomed to, but we are waiting for this scene on the balcony, and uh, we do hope that when it arrives, it will have been well worth the wait. The only way you'll be able to tell is to stick around. The crowds get a little anxious, but they are still ruling. I suspect that Prince Andrew is going to want to take some of his own photographs himself, actually. I think that he'll find that he whips out his own camera. Yes. It was he who took the Queen's birthday snaps. We keep on getting these false alarms every time a, um, a cheer goes up behind us. Lord Litchfield told me an amusing story last year. He had set it all up and gone to a great deal of trouble and was very annoyed when he got there to discover there were two other photographers from the press associations, the two main press associations there. And every time he blew his whistle and took his picture, they took a picture as well. And he had three or four cameras all on a bar um, so he could have original negatives to send round the the world and uh, he got right to the end and they were going with him shot for shot um, until he just had two shots left in his camera and he pretended for the last two to take pictures and so they shot their bolts literally <laughs> and then he said it's all over and that was when the royal family fell about laughing and he got those two shots which they didn't get yeah. Well, who does he blame for the other problem? <laughs> now, that was... it was Is that in why that... he's not back? I don't understand. <laughs> but it was in that, that photograph that, that set Diana's dress off to its best advantage. Because that yes. 30... Did you say it was... 30-foot 30 30 train. 30-foot train. Just arrayed, yes, splayed out in front of the entire family. It was just glorious. Has anybody heard a crowd estimate today? No, I haven't had one at all. I know all. you've been downstairs monitoring the BBC. Yes. Um, there, are, no, there are certainly less people than there yes, were for Prince Charles' yes. wedding because there's a gap down here in the crowd, and that was all completely filled About up. half as many, maybe? It's not a public holiday, no. they say, presumably. I all these people half, don't work. About half as many? <laughs> I'm told, though, that the, that the underground was not crowded, the trains were not crowded, that the, the streets, certainly there was not a lot of traffic. I think a lot of people called in sick today.
after, we're gonna have to lower the balcony railing in order to, <laughs> yes. to make sure we get all the IDs. I in. think Diane is holding Harry. You tell me if I'm right, just at the end of the balcony. Yes, She's there he is. Up. Yeah, but that's him waving. He's got the wave. He's got a good wave in him. <laughs> and there in the bottom right hand corner is William with my niece Laura. Laura looking as though she's taking the bow. <laughs> Laura is your sister Jane? Yes, my sister Jane's um, eldest daughter. Look at this scene behind us, Jane. These people, the four people are lifting up a wheelchair oh. so that a young lady, here, right. help me out, right through here. Just here in the green. Right down here, right down grass. here. Down below. Between Brian and Down below, look, right here, right between Jane and I. Just on the left there. Right here, Howard. Look between Jane and I. There's, there you've got it. There you've, you've got, got it. it. They are, they're, they're They have up lifted the up the wheelchair in order for the lady <laughs> to have a look. That's nice. Oh, there it is. That's a kiss. They believe it was well worth the wait. And we might add that some of those who had left came running back. <laughs> the screams go off. Queen moving back inside there. Some of the little ones too. No, <laughs> but if you're standing up there, you can't just smile dumbly. I see. You've got to keep each other entertained. <laughs> so you, you, you point intelligently. That's right. That's point correct. Thank you. And say cheese. <laughs> We're going to come back. In say royal just, refresher. <laughs> We're going to come back in just a moment. There's much more to come from London. We'll get to it right after this.